Hi, good morning, everybody. So we will give you a very, very, very brief introduction to the session before we start with the with the speakers. So we have uh, all the the time running on all the all the talks coming on running. So welcome to the to the session beyond species the species on the move emerging climate change impacts on the spatial dynamics of the species from detecting to forecasting and projecting. So let me introduce first to the to the co-conveners. Co uh, Lorenzo Cianelli, Professor Lorenzo Cianelli, who is from the Oregon State University, and myself, Manuel Hidalgo, will co-share the session today. And Rebecca Ash from the uh, East Carolina University, and Lauren Rogers from Alaska Fisheries Science Center, NOAA, will co-share the session tomorrow. We have also uh, seen Ito Ichi, uh, Ichi Ito from the University of Tokyo, but unfortunately, uh, he's not able to be today with, with us. So thank to all of you for the, uh, the love of submitting after to the, this uh, session. It was very, very successful. We are very happy with the success of this uh, session. Uh, we received around seven, more than 70 Astra submitted. It was very challenging for us to, to select those to present today. So I really appreciate the, the support. This session intends to, com to combine new advances of detecting, forecasting, and projecting climate change impacts. Uh, in the distribution shift, but also reveal other impacted uh, uh, patterns in species uh, properties that go beyond species distribution shifts. So we remind you as well that a couple of announcements that uh, tomorrow we have the keynote talk by Barbara Mullin, that will be the plenary session uh, at 8.50 in the morning, and also Lisa Kerr will, be, will give the invite talk within this room in this session at 11. We invite you as well to, the, to visit the 30 posters we have in our session tomorrow in the afternoon. And then uh, to give a few, few uh, practicalities to, to the session, um, we remind you the speakers, uh, we have a slot of 15 minutes, but we recommend you to, to allot to 12 minutes. So we have, you will advertise uh, when we have three minutes left and also when you have one minute left before ending your, your talk. So remind that word all the speakers to come to the IT people table to take your, your micro and also come back there to let back the micro uh, that you will put on to, the, to, the, to your talk. And we have nothing more to, to say. Uh, again, thank you for being here today and for the presentation. And I, after this brief intuition, I'll let you with Lorenzo to introduce the, our first speaker. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We go straight into it. Our first speaker is uh, Eric uh, Ward. Um, well, thank you. Uh, Tucson Talk, or many thanks for, for, uh, for our great organizers for putting together a really incredible session today. Um, I feel really privileged to be a part of it, and I'm really looking forward to sticking around and learning a lot uh, for the rest of the day. Um, the, today, I'll be presenting um, some work that came out of a, uh, a working group that, that we organized kind of pre-pandemic. This included a number of, um, of NOAA agency, agency scientists, in addition to collaborators at Fisheries and Oceans Canada, um, and academic partners at University of Connecticut and University of Washington in Seattle, where I'm based at the Northwest Fish Fisheries Science Center, which is part of NOAA. Um, so for background, I think that we know over the last several decades of research that um, that warming oceans, warming climates are causing big changes on, on the marine environment. Um, some work by Malin Pinsky in 2013 um, demonstrated some of these, these impacts on species distribution shifts, and so um, we can look at, at the distributions of individual species or the distributions of communities and see um, significant change. There's also been some work thinking about how this translates into habitat, and so a paper by, uh, by Lauren Rogers at the bottom um, show, estimates the change in, in habitat, whether habitats are shrinking or, or increasing based on warming conditions. Um, this is a really good example because, you know, not all species are going to be losers. Uh, the majority in, in, this, in this particular analysis, um, you know, there were many species that were having shrinking um, habitat in orange. Um, there are some winners, though, that have under warm conditions will have their habitats increase. Um, so I don't want to, uh, like, these are very valuable contributions, they're important work, and I don't, I don't want to diminish the, the importance of it, um, but they don't, these are really descriptive analyses. They don't really help us understand what's the range of environmental conditions that might limit species occurrence or distribution. And so that's, that's really our focus. Over the last five years or so, there's also been some work thinking about how we might um, how we might understand the thermal niches or, or different environmental niches of species. Um, this, paper, this uh, plot on the left is by Burroughs, and, and he 
uh, simulated um, a bunch of different uh, niches for species. So each of those different curves represents um, the thermal niche for a, for a simulated species. And you can ask questions about how, how wide or narrow are those niches and how that might be a proxy for risk, for example. Um, that's for one species. You might look beyond, um, beyond one species, look for the community. And so is the portfolio of thermal niches that you might, you might collect, is that going to be um, you know, buffering you or is it going to be something that is, um, that's going to be a problem uh, if it's very narrow? Um, so um, taking this uh, with, with just one species, we ha might have something like this curve on the right. And there's any number of metrics in addition to the range that we might calculate. Um, we could calculate metrics like if we were to reduce, uh, if we were to increase temperature by one standard deviation on the x-axis, what's the impact on, on a change in density? And so that would be, for example, the change in point D to E. Um, all of these metrics end up being pretty correlated, and so for the purposes of, of today's work, we're really just focusing on that, that range. Um, so all of, our, all of our information about species range shifts, uh, especially with ground fishes, is really being um, being uh, provided by uh, trawl survey data. And so trawl surveys are, are performed around the world, uh, like other surveys, uh, extremely valuable source of information. These are spatially random uh, sampling. And in addition to calculating or, or um, measuring quantities like aggregate catch per unit effort, we have data on indiv individual fishes, um, as well as associated environmental data like bottom temperature or oxygen. Um, I think that um, this is, you know, this, this use of trial survey data is, is probably some of the best uh, open science that's out there right now. Um, all of these data sets are being served up by agencies that are collecting them or through these public, public um, clearinghouses like uh, Malin's Ocean Adapt website. So I think, especially if you're early career, thinking about uh, potential projects, there's a lot that can be done with these data sets. So if we want to take, um, say, bottom trawl data, data and try to estimate these thermal niches for species, um, we, can, we can do this with species distribution models, and a challenge in doing this is that, um, you know, if we, uh, if we just focus on the West Coast, where I generally work, um, in, in most regions of the world, we're going to find some relationship here between uh, depth on the x-axis and uh, temperature on the y. And so in this case, there's a pretty, um, pretty strong relationship between the two. Um, and if we were to fit a species distribution model to just this data and try to estimate what that, what that thermal um, uh, niche is for a certain species, um, our conclusions would also be largely affected by depth. And so the bathymetry in, the, in a region might be really driving our inference about what, that, what the width of that thermal niche is. And so um, this is a, a potential challenge because a number of species that we're finding on the West Coast uh, actually have a, have a much broader domain. They're extending all the way up, uh, up to the North Pacific into Alaska. So the first question we wanted to, um, to, to really ask here is whether we can get better estimates of that niche width if we're, if we're thinking about combining data across multiple regions. And so to do this, um, you know, we, we really focused our, our entire domain on the North Pacific, where we're thinking about trawl survey data that's collected from the west coast of the U.S. in green, um, some, some data from British Columbia in blue, and Gulf of Alaska in purple. And I think we're, we're really approaching this in a hierarchical framework. And so um, we can, w one approach that we, w that's been used historically would be to fit different species distribution models to each, each data set independently. We're combining them all into a single um, kind of mega model. Um, and the benefit of that is that if we look at kind of these, these relationships between depth and temperature, on the right panel, we see each panel, each, each different region has slightly different relationships. And so um, that's really powerful because it allows us to separate out the effects of temperature and depth. And so I think um, that, that really uh, is, is the goal and, and hopefully will improve our, our inference. So the approach that we're using to, um, to do the modeling is, is a tool called SDM TMB. This is an R package that I've been co-developing, um, led by Sean Anderson with DFO. Um, it's essentially just a fancy regression uh, package. And so I think we can, we can include some spatial and spatiotemporal variation in addition to covariates like, in this case, bottom temperature or depth. And so um, for, the, for the first question, um, you know, how do our results change when we're combining data across regions? Uh, the panel on the left represents each of the colors, represents uh, the estimated thermal niches when we're just using data from a single region. Um, and the gray or dark line represents um, kind of the aggregate if we're combining data across all regions. 
Um, I'm not showing the uncertainty or confidence intervals here, but when we're combining data across regions, we're, we, we generally get much tighter confidence intervals, which we kind of expect. The bigger picture here I wanted to demonstrate is that um, when we're doing this region by region, our estimates are, are pretty inconsistent. And so I think um, when we, uh, when we um, do, the, do the aggregate model, we get probably a better picture of, of um, what, that, what that thermal range actually is. And from those, we can, we can do all kinds of things. We could calculate um, the range for, for each species um, and maybe, maybe use that as a proxy for risk. And so here, for each of the species in our analysis, we're just ranking them from species that, that have really broad, wide ranges or, or thermal niches to species that have really narrow ones. Um, I'm not going to pretend that there's a, a real story or clear pattern here. Uh, maybe if you squint, there's, there's maybe some more flatfishes at the top and some more, uh, some more rockfishes at the bottom. Um, so moving on to the, the, second, the second question, really um, what we're largely interested in is what, what's the trends of these species through time? So can we quantify the, the trends in the, these niches? Um, and to do this, we, kind of we, we have a three-step uh, uh, analysis. The first is to, spit, to fit spatial models of, of just bottom temperature. And so this is the, the estimate, estimated trends of bottom temperature for each of these three regions. Um, British Columbia, the California, Oregon, Washington coast, and then Gulf of Alaska. Um, I will say too that data from um, the, the U.S. West Coast and, and British Columbia really started in 2003, and so that's why we see this, this big gap here for the other colors. The second phase here is to fit independent species distribution models uh, coast-wide to, to data from both the U.S. and Canada. And then I'm going to gloss over the, the, the methodology in the inter interest of time, but really we, we just end up smashing them together to get this, this estimated thermal niche for each species in our, in our analysis. And so I pulled out these three examples or three case studies because they're, they're interesting in their own right. Um, at the top, we have Dover sole, which is a species that's, that's kind of ubiquitous throughout the North Pacific. It's, 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 um, um, it's got uh, essentially no trend with respect to its thermal niche. The red lines here represent the actual, just the environmental mean uh, bottom temperature. So it's got no trend, and it's got really wide um, uncertainty. And so I think, or, or its, it's uh, confidence intervals are really wide. The shaded blue regions represent uh, 50 to 90 percent intervals. Um, contrast that with Pacific hake, which is a species where there's a slight trend in kind of the thermal niche over time. Um, but more importantly, we have kind of a narrowing of that, um, that um, uh, it's, it's thermal niche is, is narrowing over time. And then finally, walleye pollock at the bottom, um, which is, um, you know, again, a species that has one of the most strongest, uh, strongest trends in our, uh, in our data set. Um, walleye pollock is interesting. Um, it's, it's one of the most valuable species in the Gulf of Alaska for, for commercial fisheries. Um, um, and this trend could be caused by a number of different mechanisms. It could be caused by um, walleye pollock um, um, shifting distribution and so shifting into a warmer part of the environment, or it could be caused by um, the, um, the temperatures in walleye pollock habitat warming at a faster rate than, than the rest of the do domain. So um, we can apply this then across all of the 32 species that are occurring in multiple regions on, in, in the North Pacific. Um, and then we can ask all kinds of interesting questions with these. For example, um, you know, which species are most closely tracking change? And so which have the strongest correlation between um, the thermal niche that we're estimating and the actual, um, the actual environmental signal, so the, the actual bottom temperature? We have species um, on the, the top right here are species that have really strong correlations um, and species down here that have uh, essentially no correlation. Uh, these tend to be um, maybe some of the more uh, deeper species, grenadiers, et cetera. Um, and so this, is, this, is, this could be a high-level overview. I don't think that this is necessarily a metric of risk by itself, though. The second question is whether we can, can actually think about those niche widths and think about them as response variables and, and, and in a model and think about whether temperature or a change in temperature might affect, uh, might affect the, the, the niche width or, or range that a species is inhabiting. Um, and so we're, we can fit this with some, some linear mixed models. And for a number of species, we find these significant relationships. And th they're all significant in the same direction, so that increases in temperature ca tend, tend to cause um, reductions or, or decreases in, in the niche width. Uh, these are just two examples for canary rockfish and North Pacific spiny dogfish. Um, it, with dogfish, you can really see something like this here, where, uh, where the change in temperature um, is associated also with that, that kind of that pinching of the, the estimated niche width. 
And then finally, thinking about the, uh, the Burroughs et al. paper where, um, where he was doing the simulation and looking across multiple species in the community, we can ask the same sorts of questions here. Whether there are changes in, um, in the, the niche widths or diversity of the community um, as a function of temperature or year. And, uh, we, and no, we don't really see any kind of trend here. There's not, uh, these are all, this is a mess, but it's all everything overlaid. Uh, all the niches for all species and all years are overlaid on each other. Um, but there's essentially no trend here. So there doesn't seem to be a uh, change in the diversity of, uh, uh, with respect to the community. Um, so just to summarize our, our next steps and future directions, um, you know, I think that this pipeline with SDM TMB provides a really powerful tool for doing this kind of modeling hierarchically and, and creating a pipeline that can be really um, adaptable to other sorts of data beyond just trawl survey data. Um, it allows um, you know, us to, to kind of rank and prioritize species um, with respect to, uh, to which might be most susceptible or, or um, in which cases might a change in, in temperature or the environment um, affect species the most. Um, the challenges here are that I think that this is really just a baby step forward with respect to um, um, getting towards a more mechanistic model. Um, there certainly are cases where multiple environmental drivers like, like both te temperature and oxygen might be limiting. And so we have to think about doing this beyond just the one-dimensional case and think about doing this in two dimensions. Um, and finally, I think that you know, we, we can also have the opportunity to pull in other data and so move beyond just this, um, this species distribution model to an integrated approach where we're bringing in data from, um, from other field studies or, or lab work, et cetera. And so I'll be um, talking about the latter. I'll give you, give you an example in the same session later for Tim Essington uh, as an example of more of an integrated SDM approach. Um, and with that, I will take any questions uh, and edit. for one quick question. If you have a question, please step here to the benefit of those who are listening online. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I was wondering about, um, actually there were two questions uh, for me on, uh, Yes, was the, was the, was the cross-validation that you have in the, in, in the pipeline your, of your package? The cross-validation uh, in, the, in the pipeline of your package. Right, um, good question, yeah, what's, what's the, the, the validation? I think that um, you know, we've done a lot of spatial cross-validation. Microphone. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, I passed Use this. Oh, they don't hear you, they don't me. <laughs> Thanks, sorry. Um, Good question. The question was, uh, what's the cross-validation? We've done a lot of spatial cross-validation uh, with like the spatial CV, our, our package, and there's other, other cases, but yeah, spatial cross-validation. All right, thank you. We can switch over now to Alba Foster Alonso. And I invite also the following speakers to go to the back in order to get their uh, headset for the talks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, hello, my name is Alba. I'm a PhD student in statistics and optimization. And I'm here presenting my work, Application of Bayesian Additive Regression Trees to Global Scale Species Distribution Models. To contextualize, marine ecosystem models has been developed to analyze the past and future dynamics of the oceans to better understand how marine ecosystems and services they provide to humans are likely to change. One of such efforts is ECOOcean, a complex mechanistic and spatiotemporal explicit marine ecosystem model of the global oceans based on a trophodynamic core. Commonly, marine ecosystem models parameters are obtained from data using statistical models or elicited from expert input. But we have to be careful because the uncertainty associated to these parameters can influence the validation and, pre and precision of the marine ecosystem model result. For that, further improvements are needed in order to account for the spatial heterogeneity of species and functional groups. 
Some of the inputs that in particular, in particular Ecocean requires are, for example, the native ranges that are where the, species, where the species are in the present, the suitable habitats that is where the species could be at the present, also the response function of the covariates, and finally, suitable habitats, but using future projections. Ah, sorry. So we try to um, improve these inputs, to optimize these inputs with the use of species distribution models. Species, distribu species distribution models has been widely applied in ecology to analyze the distribution and the relationship with the environment of target species. And we can find an endless number of species distribution models from simple uh, approaches such as generalizing linear models to more complex approaches such as geostatistical models. And in the last decades, machine learning tools have been adapted as species distribution models. A new promising alternative to traditional classified trees methods for species distribution model is the Bayesian additive regression trees. This is a non-parametric Bayesian regression approach and a powerful machine learning tool that could be useful for some ecological problems such as species distribution model. It was developed by Chipman in 2010 and has been adapted for a species distribution model for another um, scientific, but always from a regional or local perspective. So what is behind BART? BART is essentially a sum of trees model that is an additive model with multivariate components. To clarify the idea, we consider an unknown function f that predicts an output, in this case p, that is our parameter of interest. And it uses a dimensional p vector of inputs that are our environmental covariates. So our model will be the variable of interest here is a binary variable, presence and absence. So it follows a Bernoulli distribution where the parameter of interest is p, that is going to be the probability of present, and is linked to the predictors through a link function that it, here is the probit. And we need to make inference about f in order to know the, the parameter of interest, that is the probability. And the form of this unknown function here is going to be a sum of three models. As you can see, we have g, that is the regression tree. Uh, we have a sum of multiple regression trees. And inside of the regression tree, we have the covariates, that uh, are environmental variables or any driver that you want to add to the model. And then we have also t that denote a binary tree that consists of a set of interior, decis uh, of interior nodes with decision rules and a set of terminal nodes. And also m that denote a set of parameter values associated with each of the terminal nodes of, the terminal nodes of t. And finally, we complete the VAR model specification by imposing a prior distribution of all of the parameters of the sum of three model. And this is so important because some of the critics that machine learning tools have is that they tend to overfit the prediction. And we can avoid that to keeping the individual trees effect from being a dual influential to each other with these prior distributions. So our work, the goal is to um, apply this Bayesian IT reversion tree to global scale species distribution model to improve the input that inform marine ecosystem models. And for this purpose, we have performed the following steps. First, we choose a functional group, in this case the marine turtles, to test whether VAR can be implemented on a global scale. Then we predict the native ranges and the suitable habitats. Also, we estimate the response function of the covariates. And finally, we predict future, uh, fu suitable habitats using future predictions. So BART needs two inputs to operate properly. The first one is the present absence data. We have used GBIF for the presence data, and we have to generate the pseudo absence. We have done this randomly and the same amount of absence than present for each of the species. And also we need to to have covariates. In this case, we have downloaded several covariates from EasyMeet, from the round simulation EasyMeet 3B. And we have used three climate scenarios, the historical, for the historical distribution of the species, and two 
future projection from SSP126 and SSP5A5. The first one is a more conservative scenario and the second one is a more pessimistic scenario. And we download this for, from two different climate forces, the IPCL and GFDL. So here I'm going to present you the presence for all the species that we have used in this work. We have a total of seven species. And as you can see, this is a really heterogeneous group. So this is good for test if VAR could be implemented in a global scale or not. And here we have the covariates for GFDL. We have a salinity, oxygen, sea surface temperature, and three types of primary production. For IPCL, we have salinity, one primary production, oxygen, and sea surface temperature. And then I'm going to present you the results that we have obtained for the whole functional group. Point out that we have the results for each of the species, but for a matter of time, I'm going to present like the results for the whole functional group. So here we have the native ranges with the GFDL scenario. Since we are working in the Bayesian paradigm, we have the predictive posterior distribution and we could obtain the mean of this posterior predicting distribution and also the credible intervals and uh, the uncertainty by the standard deviation of these uh, posterior distributions. The native, the, different, the native ranges are the um, the distribution of the species at the present and we add the locations to the model. So this is the difference between the native range and the suitable habitat. In the suitable habitat, you only have, you only have environmental variables, and here you somehow constrain the distribution, not only to the potential conditions. And here we have the same results, but for, for IPSL, we could see that there are some differences between GFDL and IPCL, but it makes sense because we have different covariates for each of the models. And then we have the suitable habitats, that is the potential distribution of the species. And as well as with the native ranges, we have the mean posterior distribution, also the credible intervals, and finally, the uncertainty as the standard deviation. Here for IPCL, as you can see here, you have like more difference, the difference I intensify because we are only consider, considering environmental covariates and if these environmental covariates are different, of course the results are going to be different. Uh, here I'm presenting you the functional, the functional responses for only one species, but we have obtained this for each of the species, oxygen, salinity, the primary production and the temperature. And finally, here you have the future projection with the GFDL for the first climate scenario, that is a more conservative scenario. We have done the future projection from 2015 to 2100. And here we have the difference between the historical prediction and the last year of the future prediction. We have the same result, but for the second climate scenario, that is a more pessimistic climate scenario. And here you see the difference like more intensified. And finally, we have also this same, but for the IPCL with the first scenario and the difference, and also with the second scenario and the difference between the historical and the last year of the projection. So some of the conclusion that we could extract from this work is that VAR is a suitable approach for species distribution models on global scale. Also that its main advantages are the computational efficiency, the, avail the ability to incorporate prior distribution to avoid, to avoid the overfitting of the decision trees. Also the flexibility of the Bayesian paradigm to evaluate the uncertainty. Also that the global perspective is essential for the evaluation of climate change and to guide valuable management approaches with global policy objectives. That our first application of VAR to marine turtles show promising changes in their spatial distribution in accordance with environmental variables. And also that the results obtained are potentially useful for informing marine ecosystem models. 
some witnesses and future lines of this war. The first one is the generation of the pseudo assets, since there is not a clear protocol on how to do this, and of course your results are gonna change depending on how to generate the pseudo assets. I have seen like, you can generate this random, you can generate according to environmental variables, but at the end you have a response variable that is binary and you are, and you have like the half of the, of the response. Also that we are not modeling the spatio-temporal dependence because for the native ranges what we do is like add a smooth function with the coordinates but it, that is not directly spatio-temporal dependence. And finally that is necessary to continue applying the BART approach with other species and use the results as input in ecoceans. Here are some preferences. And this work is part of the ProOceans project, and here you have the whole team that is currently working in ProOceans. So thank you for your attention. Okay, very good. Thank, thank you. We have time for questions, and I can also bring... Um, yeah, thank, thanks for the talk. And you mentioned there at the end the pseudo-absences, and I had a question earlier, and so sorry if I missed it, but how did you... How did you go about um, coming up with absences from GBIF data for the We binomial? do it completely randomly, like we just do a sample, and the same, num the same number of presents that the pseudo absence. Because I think this is, if we do that randomly, we at least don't condition the presence. That is my opinion, but maybe there is, if we were not working global, if maybe you have like a local region or something like that, and you really understand what is happening behind, behind this presence, maybe you could find like a more fancy way to, to generate the random pseudo absence. But since we are trying to do this for all the species in the world, I think it's better to do it randomly and the same amount of present than pseudo absence. All right, great, thank you very much. We can, uh, and our net next and last speaker for uh, this session is uh, Elliot Hazen. Thank you. thank you very much. I'm going to be presenting on some work even though my name is on this slide. It is not my work, but those of my co-authors on recommendations for quantifying and reducing uncertainty in climate projections of species distributions. Hopefully we're all very familiar with the plot on the left from the IPCC where you can kind of parse a where the different sources of variability that contribute to our understanding. So you have the internal variability in orange, you have model spread, different models you choose in blue, and then the RCP scenarios in green. And we wanted to do the same thing for our fisheries projections as well. So as I mentioned, this isn't my work, but the work of Stephanie Brody and Melissa Karp. So if you have really detailed questions, I'll probably point to them instead of myself, but I'm happy to present it for them at this conference. So a little push, we need accurate predictions across all forecast horizons. So climate change is one of many different scales at which the environment is changing, but we have things like nowcasts to look at things like dynamic bycatch avoidance for a fishery, to be able to tell when there's harmful algal blooms that may shut down a valuable fishery. We, might, we need these decadal forecasts, which might be the least developed of our forecasts, to understand when you might want to open a, a fishing season or close it and how to, an industry might want to invest depending on how the season is looking likely to be. Year to decadal, we have quota setting decisions that can be made, and then license planning as well, whether you want to maybe restrict or allow more licenses. And then lastly, the climate change, the decades to century, are really important for things like semi-permanent spatial planning, things like wind farms that you're not going to be able to move in the future if the species that you're concerned about might move. And then also priority setting into the future. And this was really, um, inspired by Alistair Hobday's paper a few years ago. So how confident can we be in our species distributions out to 2100? So I'm gonna present on two simulation studies, focusing a lot more on the first and the second, but the reason being is these simulated species give us a known truth, right? In pro is you can compare the predictions with what we know, what we've told the species how to behave, but the con is they're obviously a very drastic oversimplification of an ecosystem. So there's three simulated species archetypes. So we have a highly migratory species shown there on the left. We have a ground fish species in the middle and then a coastal pelagic species on the right. And you'll see kind of how those uh, move in space and time in the next slide. In the second study, we're gonna look just at the highly mobile species and look at how sampling design 
actually affects our models. And this is really important because in many areas of the world, we don't have fisheries independent surveys or tagging data, but we rely on fisheries dependent data itself. And so the, fishery, the fishers are not sampling the environment randomly, and we wanted to figure out how that might influence the model results as well. So ultimately, we know the species are going to be moving as the ocean climate changes, but how can we use our knowledge to best predict these changes and uncertainty associated? So just a quick introduction into species distribution models. I'll go quickly because this is the third time I think you've seen this, have you been here all day? Um, we have some type of data, this can be sightings data, uh, it can be opportunistic, it can be, again, independent surveys, fisheries dependent data, you can have tag data like shown here, or even behavioral data if you want to build a species distribution model. You have some sample predictive data shown in the bottom left, things like sea surface height, sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, bottom temperature. You fit a statistic model, statistical model, and there are a lot of different choices that can be made. And this is an important consideration. They all have different assumptions and have different strengths and weaknesses. So we'll talk a little bit more about what that means moving forward. And then ultimately, if you've been able to define these species environment relationships, at least at a particular space and time, you then can predict into the future how a species habitat preference is likely to be at these different time scales that I mentioned. So the study questions that we're hoping to address, the first four are from the first paper, and then the second one is from the second paper. Uh, how does covariate choice influence the SDM prediction accuracy? How does SDM performance, so species distribution model performance, degrade, particularly over time or in areas when you go beyond the environmental niche of the original samples? Which leads to the third is how these SDMs perform under extrapolation. And then can you quantify these different sources of uncertainty and how they change over time, particularly when you're trying to set up kind of management advice? And then the last question is how does this sampling bias, such as the fisheries dependent data, affect model performance, especially when extrapolating into novel conditions? So I'm going to go through these four different steps, the Earth system models, the operating models, the estimation models, and the performance metrics that we use to evaluate. But we're very fortunate in the California Current to have downscaled models from three different Earth system models, the GFDL model in blue, the Hadley in, in kind of black, and the IPC, IPSL in red. So we're not exploring the different scenarios here in the study, but instead we're using the range of, uh, out of the 26 models, those three that had a really big spread to get an idea for variability. And this is all thanks to Mayor Pozobui, who's been able to downscale those Earth system models to 10 kilometer scale for the mixed layer depth, sea surface temperature, and integrated zooplankton down to 200 meters. Then for the operating models, as was asked you know, in a previous talk, we used a lot of our understanding from previously fit species distribution models to understand where these species, something like a tuna or a swordfish, is likely oriented within the California current on the top left, something like, again, a coastal pelagic species in the top center. You can see more of the coastal hugging there. And then some ground fish species that might have a particular kind of affinity for the shelf break, for example, in this case. And then from that, you can look at how the change is likely to be. So the top three are the historical period from our simulated data, and the bottom three are predictions. So you can see areas where biomass is gained in blue and areas where biomass is predicted to be lost in red. So then once we have those operating models, we can fit a whole suite of estimation models. So even though we mentioned here 15 species distribution models, when you populate that through, it ends up running over 250 models to look at the various different combinations. But we have models that go through the rows from environment only, space only, space and time, environment plus space, environment plus space time, and then environment with some residual autocorrelation as well. And for the model types, um, there we do not have the BARTs in here, even though I know that Barb Muling, if you go to her talk tomorrow, hopefully we'll talk a little bit about them, but maybe not. Uh, we had GAMs, generalized additive models, generalized linear mixed models, boosted regression trees, and then a multi-layer perceptron, which is a form of an artificial neural network as well, to get more into the AI space. We hadn't included chat GPT because it didn't exist at the time, but that's an <laughs> important follow-up study. So in terms of the model performance, this is one of my favorite slides from the paper, is that it's generally good, but it declines over time. So you have on the y-axis here the correlation between the observed and predicted, and then on the right y-axis you have basically the level of environmental extrapolation. So you can measure how far out of your comfort zone are you going. And in almost all of the cases you can see you increase your variability, you increase your spread as you go out in terms of environmental extrapolation space. 
Also, you can see that the decadal trends are driven by the environment. There's some examples of things like even maybe like marine heat waves that might come in and change this. But then again, at each one of these examples, as you get further into time, the variability increases. So another important aspect of this is that poor, some of the poorly fit models didn't always predict poorly. And this is one of those things when you're really trying to get into the inference to understand the ecological relationships, you want to fit models differently potentially than when you're trying to actually do a good prediction. So you have, again, correlation on the y-axis here between the observed and predicted biomass, and then the different estimation models. And you can see those, we had really high levels um, for a number of the models and a number of the different species types. But then in the bottom, you can see even some of those poorly fit models, we still were getting correlations above 0.75, which is pretty high. And when you include spatial covariates, these are like the, sp uh, the spline of Latin longitude, they help a lot for the coastal pelagic and ground fish archetypes, even more so in some cases than the highland migratory species. You can also look how, again, how that changes over time between the well-fit models and the poorly fit models. And this is where we're really able to kind of now spread apart what are the things that are contributing to the variance. So this is all relative uncertainty. So you saw this, how the spread increases over time in the previous slides. But now we're trying to say, can we divide it into Earth system models of the three that I presented in light blue, the different choice of SDM types in kind of the gray, and then the dark blue for the SDM parameters. And as mentioned, the variance increases over time. But often, particularly as you move forward, the uncertainty in your species distribution model choice surpasses that of the Earth system model uncertainty. So that's an important thing just to consider that, you know, when we're thinking about building these ensembles of ecological species similar to what we do for our oceanography, we want to include multiple SDM types, not just a single favorite one. I really like GAMS personally. So then in addition, if you look spatially, you can look from the Southern California Bight in the south here, Central California up to the north, and there were, again, different patterns in how this variance was partitioned. The northern regions in particular, you'll notice that light blue, I don't know if the laser will work here, you can't see, but particularly for the northern region had the lowest kind of contribution to the uncertainty compared to the other regions. And that's a large part because there was greater agreement among the Earth system models. So that's, an, again, another important consideration that when you have that agreement, you're likely to get difference in patterning um, spatially as well. So in the second study I'll talk quickly about is we have the different forms of sampling. We have random sampling in the top left, preferential sampling, a bycatch avoidance scenario where you have a fishing vessel that's trying to avoid bycatch, a closed area, you can see the, the vessel simulated stacking up against the, the closed area, and then a distance from port. So if you have kind of localized fishing um, fleets. And what you find out is that basically the different, obviously the different sampling patterns resulted in different uh, kind of skill. And we have Hellinger distance on the y-axis, Cohen's D on the x. The lower your Hellinger's distance, and then the closest to zero, the better you get. And what you can see is that the random in all cases does the best. That's sampling the broadest environmental niche. It makes perfect sense. The important part of this, too, is that when you have port-only sampling, similar to the talk that Eric was mentioning from when you're looking across different regions, you do a worse job because you're only getting a part of potentially that species' habitat range. And then, as with the previous study, the environmental conditions became increasingly novel, more extrapolated over time, represented um, compared to the sampling period. So in conclusion, this was a very nice infographic that Steph put together, but it really does a good job kind of summarizing this. I didn't show it as much, but it's really important for us to do a better job quantifying and communicating uncertainty. The weather you know, folks do it, the oceanography folks do it, we need to be better in the ecological realm as well. Using multiple Earth system models, I will say also multiple scenarios, in addition to multiple species distribution models, is important to best capture different sources of variability, and then allows us to essentially quantify these, how these different sources of uncertainty persist over time. So it, out to about 40 years, we were able to get more dominated by the decadal signal, and then, as you saw, as it went on in time, the, the variance spread. So one approach, in addition to trying to come up with the best fit model, you want to prioritize reducing the species distribution model extrapolation. So don't subsample if you can avoid it. Try to sample throughout the entire range of your species to get a good idea of where they, ex where they live. This is one thing where, one area where marine heat waves may actually do us good because they're giving us some higher temperatures that these species are um, exhibiting or, or experiencing so we can get an idea for how they're likely to change. 
Definitely consider including spatial covariates, as was mentioned in the previous talk. They tie to some of these unexplained processes that you might not be able to include in your models. And then consider specifically how these different spatiotemporal processes are represented. Some of the artificial intelligence approaches can take into account year potentially better than a GAM that might just simply kind of shoot off the curve by the way that it extrapolates. So with that, if there's still time, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for sticking around. We have time for questions. Thanks, Elliot. Great talk. So I was struck, if I understood it correctly, that when you were looking at sort of the uncertainty spread and the modeling, um, how much temperature did not or did, and so ground fish stuck, stuck out to me. But of the parameters that were not temperature, did you do any digging to see if it was more of the biologically modeled versus the physical model? Because I was wondering about the zooplankton integration, if that was causing some of the spread. Yeah, we didn't do as much digging into this. I'd, I'd suggest talking to Steph at the break, but because, again, it was all simulated data, it was kind of it was doing what we told it to do, um, if that made sense. So, uh, yeah, I'd suggest talking to Steph a little more at the break about the details there. Thanks. We have time for uh, more questions. Thanks for the talk a lot. Um, um, it's difficult for me to formulate it, but um, I understand uncertainty as noise in the data or noise in the prediction, and uh, or somebody call it uh, natural variability. And uh, when we do extrapolation, we actually do not want to simulate uh, noise. We would like right. to see the, the trend um, and to see how, yes, on the average, basically, right. uh, things are changing. And, um, and therefore, I, I have difficulty to, to, to understand the reduction of uncertainty uh, in, in this sense, because perhaps I, I missed the part of the... <laughs> no worries. So the, the goal that I was trying to mention is if you can sample a species over a broader environmental niche, so over a broader temperature range or over a broader um, chlorophyll range, you will reduce the need to extrapolate, which will in turn reduce the variability. So yeah, I mean, what you're saying is exactly right. We don't want that variability, but we often want the ability to extrapolate into new areas, or particularly if we're going out to 2100. But if we can't capture those extreme events or captures the warmer edges of a species habitat, we can do a better job modeling into these kind of novel predictions. And getting into the SDM choice, it becomes important because, as I was mentioning quickly, but generalized additive models, for example, will continue the curve. So if you have an increasing curve, it will just keep shooting. Some of the other tools like boosted regression trees will yeah. flatten off. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you a lot. Yeah. Okay, great. So that, sorry. <laughs> that concludes our session for, um, for now. So there is a lunch break. Thank you very much to the speakers. Great job. Yeah, see you in one hour here. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here again. So we need to reconvene and continue with the session, with the session 10. So our first uh, skipper, uh, speaker this afternoon will be Melissa Karp. So anyone, thank you very much. All right, thank you everyone for joining after lunch break. Um, yes, I'm Melissa Karp. I'm a fish biologist at NOAA Fisheries. And I'm going to talk today about this effort we're working on to increase the um, access to distribution information. <clears throat> so I don't think it's a surprise to anyone in this room that the ocean is changing. We're seeing you know, rising sea levels, ocean acidification. We heard earlier today in the plenary the loss of sea ice and um, warming oceans. And these are all collectively having impacts on marine fish species, and in particular, impacting their abundance and distributions. Now, the impacts of distribution shifts reach beyond just the one species experiencing that shift to potentially change entire ecosystems and fishing communities. So for instance, shown here on the left of the slide is showing the change in overlap between a predator species, in this case, Eritus flounder, and its prey, walleye pollock, in the eastern Bering Sea um, due to changing in the cold pool extent um, between two years. So changing predator-prey interactions. And then you have on the right here, um, 
kind of a hypothetical situation of a fishery where in the 1970s they were catching predominantly cool water species with some subtropical and then as water is warm they're catching less of the cool water and more of the subtropical and tropical species. So these changing distributions are also affecting what fishermen are catching. So having information on species distributions is important for both biodiversity conservation and fisheries management. So I mentioned there's this high demand for species distribution information to use in our fishery science and management um, decisions. And no fisheries and our partners collect extensive information on species distributions through our surveys and, in, and are increasingly conducting research on the distributions of fish stocks. However, this information is not always readily available in a consistent, useful, and easy to access format across the region. So a group of us at NOAA were thinking, well, how do we improve access and delivery of this information to a, a broader stakeholder group? And that led us to develop this distribution mapping analysis portal and this portal also grew out of previous work, which I actually heard about earlier today, um, with Malin Pinsky at Rutgers on the Ocean Adapt project. So this grew off of that previous collaborative partnership to really take that kind of national um, website portal and bring it kind of next generation. So we set up this portal to provide access to distribution information and allow end users to dynamically view, download, and interact with species distribution information for over 400 marine fish and invertebrate species. So I mentioned one of our goals was to improve access to this information, but we also hope that through this portal we can support decision makers to use spatial distribution information in their uh, decision making, such as informing fish enclosed areas, marine protected areas, allocation decisions, as well as informing survey designs. We also hope that this can foster sharing and exchange of practices and ideas among scientists working on spatial distribution modeling. So the portal will have several different modules where users can interact with and analyze the data in different ways. Um, the four modules that we have here, um, a single species distribution module where you can explore visual and numerical representations of a single species distribution, a multi-species overlap and interactions module where you can explore the interactions of species distribution through time and kind of like a predator-prey overlap or predator uh, target species and bycatch species, for instance, looking at some of the socioeconomic impacts and how distribution shifts affect the availability of fish species to particular ports of interest, and then a regional summary module where you explore kind of how species within a region on a whole are, are shifting through time. So these are modules that we have um, hoped to explore into the portal, but right now we just have two of them available, the single species distribution and the regional summary module, and I'll, I'll talk about those two today. So just quickly, I wanted to run through kind of our steps in how we uh, get this data onto the portal. So first, we um, are downloading the survey data from regional databases and run it through an R script to uh, process and clean the data. So um, that involves evaluating the survey coverage to ensure that we're having kind of a consistent spatial footprint through time, so that means that we might eliminate some strata that are poorly sampled through time or particular years that have poor survey coverage. So those are taken out of the analysis. We also then trim the data set to only include species that are caught in at least 5% of toes in a given year across three quarters of the year. So that way, if a species is caught only once or twice in a given year, we're not gonna try to model its distribution from only a few data points. And this led to over 400 species from our surveys that were included um, for the portal. And our final process data has these kind of following variables of, you know, the region, the year, lat long, weight CPUE. And from that, we take that uh, final process data set for all the regions, and we run it through a Python script using an inverse distance weighted interpolation. Um, there's some specifics on here from that. We use, uh, we cube root transform the weight CPUE. We use a spatial weighting kind of parameters um, for it. We also included this temporal weighting, so we're including um, five years of data to inform the distribution for the one year. Um, so two years on either side are informing each year's uh, distribution. A two kilometer by two kilometer pixel cell size, that's what we use for um, all the regions except in Hawaii, we're using a 500 meter by 500 meter grid cell. And here just shows two examples, one from the Northeast um, United States, and then this other one from Eastern Bering Sea. 
So from those distribution surfaces, we then calculate um, two uh, range shifting measures, so center of gravity, which is the central location of the uh, distribution, kind of that biomass weighted average location, and the range limits, which are the northern, like the 95% for the northern boundary and the 5% um, kind of cumulative distribution for the southernmost boundary. And that's shown here on the graph for an example species, where the red line is that center of gravity and the blue lines, the blue uh, band indicates kind of the northern range and the southern range for that species through time. We also have this regional summary module where we take a core set of species, so species that were caught again in 5% of toes in a given year, but in all years of the survey. So these are species that were found throughout the entire survey time series. We take an average change in latitude and average change in depth from those core set of species. And then we also generate species richness maps by stacking all those distributions on top and getting kind of a change in the spatial richness um, in that particular area through time. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So I want to do kind of a, a video demo, but I decided not to mess with technology too much here. So I'm going to kind of do some static slides to go through kind of how you would interact with the website. So you first get brought to this welcome page with some information um, about the two modules, the single species and the regional. And then there's a technical document that links to and go through a little more detail of our interpolation methods and where we get the data and links to those uh, regional databases. And then metadata as well has more information about the different layers and how you can um, download some of them for use outside the portal. So then once you click out of that, you have the option to select a species. And again, we have over 400 species to choose from. Um, in a future version, we're going to have a filtering capacity or filtering ability, so you could filter the list based on taxonomy or fishery management plan, region, to help narrow down those species. But in this image, it's just you, you can type in the name or you can scroll through, pick your species of interest, uh, pick your data set of interest, and right now that's kind of just the, the survey that it came from. And then the portal plots on the map here, the distribution, shown kind of in the, the interpolated biomass distribution shown in the purple green cloud. And then the points that are overlaid are the survey data points with the size of the bubble indicating how much was caught in that particular area. And then it's animated, so you can hit play and then it will show the distribution moving through time. And then on the panel on the side is those distribution metrics, change in gravity, or change in center of gravity. <laughs> and range limits on the top, and then the bottom graph is the change in depth through time. You can also download this data to use outside the portal, so you can download all the distribution metrics um, from those graphs, and you can also download the survey points that were used in that interpolation um, to use outside. Currently, you can't download the interpolated biomass layer from this portal, but if you click on the metadata, you can get access to it um, through there if, you're savvy with our APIs and stuff like that. Uh, we also have this, I should go back, this area analysis tool. You can see the tab on the left panel. So you click on the area analysis tool, and this enables you to draw an area of interest. So here I've drawn a polygon off of um, New Jersey, Long Island Sound, United States. And the portal then will calculate two metrics. The top graph is showing the proportion of that area that you've drawn that is covered by the species distribution. And then the second plot shows the proportion of the species distribution or total biomass found within that area. So this can allow you to explore changes in distribution relative to particular areas of interest and if you're gonna see more or less of that species in that area through time. And then here I mentioned that um, we have that species uh, summary, regional summary module. And this again, this is on the graph, on the, sorry, on the map here is showing the core species richness through time. And then the plots on the panel on the side are showing the average change in latitude. Um, so in this case, in Northeast, you can see that on average species are shifting north in the Northeast. And there's also then the average change in depth on the bottom graph. 
So for next steps for this uh, project, we are going to be conducting annual updates of the interpolated biomass layers to pull in the next year of survey data. We're also hoping to include additional types of survey data. So right now the portal is limited to uh, bottom trawl survey data in the you know, continental United States and Alaska. And um, in Hawaii, we're using their bottom fish independent survey data, but hoping to explore to um, additional data types. Also, um, as I mentioned, these are interpolated biomass layers, so no environmental conditions are included in these distribution maps. So hoping to in the future include SDM, um, environmentally linked SDM outputs in the portal and to provide also forecasts of changing distributions through time. And then also plan to work with stakeholders to scope and build out those two additional modules on port availability and multi-species overlap. And with that, I just want to thank and recognize here that this is a, a large team effort um, composed of uh, no scientists in each of our regional science centers. Um, so we have our, and also our core developers um, who are working on building it and partnership with Rutgers. And with that, I invite you guys to uh, come visit our site and um, open any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. We have time for one quick question. Hi, thank you for a nice presentation. And uh, this is probably going to be an amazing portal to get data. Um, earlier this morning, we were listening to at least Elliot Hazen's presentation on uh, reducing uncertainty and how important it is to get those uh, rare events. Uh, but actually, in your methodology, you're excluding um, the rare events. Uh, is, are you thinking about including that in the future, or how would that affect the interpretability of, of the distribution? Yeah, that is a challenge because in our filtering we are potentially removing species that are rarely caught species. Our kind of thought for that is that these bottom trawl surveys are designed for specific purposes to catch specific types of species. And so most of the species that we're excluding are ones that aren't very well sampled by a bottom trawl survey. So um, making a distribution from the one or two times you might catch like a soft coral or a hard coral in it um, didn't really make sense for distribution mapping. But yeah, understanding also as things are shifting into new areas, if that information we're not really able to capture at the moment, um, but maybe something to explore. Sorry, we can not have time for it. You can catch up later. Thank you, Monica, for your Thank time. You. Well, our next speaker. <laughs> our next speaker is Rebecca Howard. All right, everyone. Um, I'm Rebecca. I'm a PhD student at Oregon State University. Um, I'm going to be presenting some of the work from one of the chapters of my dissertation. This is ongoing, so this is in progress. Um, but my colleagues and I have been working on looking at the influence of size and life history on the distribution of juvenile fish. And so most of you are familiar with the life cycle of a fish, but we're going to be talking about some of the early life history today. So I just wanted to go through the stages of a fish's life. So most fish in the ocean and start out as eggs, obviously. Um, some end up in the water column, some hatch internally for species such as rockfish. Either way, they progress into larvae, which then develop into juveniles. Those juveniles then turn into adults, and the adults become spawners starting that life cycle over again. And so today we're going to be focusing on how ocean conditions affect those different life history stages. So we don't necessarily expect that temperature, for example, will affect eggs the same way as it might affect spawners. So for example, temperature may increase the uh, rate of development of eggs, but it may not have a positive effect on spawners. Um, and today I'm just going to be focusing on this part of the life cycle. So these are some of the more vulnerable early life history stages. Um, generally, on the, we're going to be focusing on the species prior to recruitment. So sort of in that larval to juvenile stage, um, and we'll refer to those as pre-recruits. So the objectives for this research um, were, t were several. So we wanted to determine if variability in life history impacts how we can best model the distributions 
of different fish species. So that generalized life cycle has a lot of different variation depending on the species, and so we don't necessarily expect that the same type of modeling might work well for different life histories. Some grow much faster than others, um, and those kinds of things. The second objective is to evaluate the benefit of using species distribution models that incorporate size. So we have a lot of length data and things like that out there, um, and so we can potentially incorporate that into species distribution models to look at different life stages and not just model the abundance data without that incorporated. Um, and then the last objective I have not gotten to yet, but it's relevant to today's talk, um, and that's to investigate how fish distributions change in response to climate change. Um, and so this will come into play in a little bit. So to start with, I wanted to tell you about the data that we're using. I'm using two different NOAA surveys. Um, the first one is the Rockfish Recruitment Ecosystem Assessment Survey. Um, that happens off of the west coast of the United States, uh, generally off the coast of California. And then the Northern California Current Pre-Recruit Survey is a second survey, um, and it occurs off the northern part, um, off of Oregon and Washington. Um, these surveys uh, occur in the California current system, which is an eastern boundary current system characterized by upwelling. Uh, they're collected from about April to June, and today I'm gonna to be using the 2011 to 2018 data due to some limitations on when data was collected in either survey. For the species, I have five different ones with varying life histories. So the first one is northern anchovy. As many of you know, it's a small pelagic. It's much more short-lived than some of these other species. Then we have the two rockfish species. They're somewhat different from each other. Um, short belly rockfish may be more similar to a small pelagic than widow rockfish. Um, and then we have Pacific hake. Pacific hake is the largest fishery off the US West Coast, and it's a gadid. And then we have Pacific sand dab on the bottom, which is a flatfish that actually spends a long time in the water column uh, as larva. And for all of these, I'm going to be using catch and size data for pelagic juveniles, so those pre-recruits. For the environmental data, I'm not actually using the data that's collected with the surveys, and this is because of that third objective to forecast distributions into the future. So I'm using the Northeast Pacific ROMS. This is a regional ocean modeling system for the um, area that you can see in those two top panels. The middle one shows you uh, mean sea surface temperature for the region, and then that bottom one just shows you um, actual observed temperatures. Today I'm just talking about the hindcast because I'm parameterizing the models, not doing the forecasting yet and that runs from 1995 to 2018. And then the future work is going to use the CMIP-6 scenarios to do the forecasting. To give you an idea of what that lo looks like, the scale of the um, ROMS model output, um, this is sea surface temperatures for every month during 2015, and so you can just see the change over time in temperature. For my methods, I'm using generalized additive models, or GAMs. Many of you are familiar with these, but they're statistical models that allow for nonlinear relationships between the response and covariates. Um, I'm using a Tweety distribution with a log link because the data is very zero-inflated, and then also incorporating something called a varying coefficient term. And so that's that lon lat by h term. It's also at the end of the equation down there. And this allows location of catch to vary with sea surface height. And by sea surface height here, I mean a annual value that I've calculated um, for about May to July for within the 100 meter isobath for each year. So this isn't a co-located uh, sea surface height value like you can see in the middle of the equation. Um, this is an annual value. And so you can see I have also included a couple other environmental covariates. We have sea surface temperature and sea surface salinity. Um, I've included year as a factor, and some of you may be wondering how we're going to deal with this for forecasting. I'm not going to get into it right now, um, but I'm happy to talk about this later. Um, and then we've also included a normal spatial term, day of year, and depth. For um, the size portion of the model, we have two different types of models. Um, we have the size aggregated model, which is essentially your regular species distribution model. We're incorporating all of the abundance data. There's no um, incorporation of size in this model, so we get the predictions out. Then for the size structured model, we have two different size groups. We have the small and the large. Um, and so the small model is essentially the proportion of the abundance that's represented by small fish, and the large is the same. Um, we run both of those models, add them together, and then get the predictions out. 
To compare them, I am using leave one group out cross validation. And so this is, looks like a mess, but this is uh, how I am doing that leave one group out cross validation. So for the first uh, row, for example, I leave out 2000, train the model on the rest of the years, predict on that left out year, and so on. So then I calculate a root mean square error for each year, and then get an average of all of them for each model and each species. And so that's how that comparison works. And then onto those results. Um, so for all of these species, I want you to primarily look at that right column, which is the change from the aggregated to the structured model in terms of root mean square error. So for northern anchovy, what we're seeing is a reduction in root mean square error from the aggregated to the structured model, which means an improvement in better predictions, potentially. Um, for short belly rockfish and widow rockfish, we do not see that. There's no change. Same root mean square error for both. For Pacific cake and Pacific sand dab, we actually saw an increase from the size aggregated to the size structured model, indicating that maybe you don't need to incorporate size to get good predictions for those two species. However, I do want to talk about why size may still be important for species like Pacific hake or Pacific sand dab that appear on the surface to maybe not be suitable for that. So what you can see here are three different panels. The panel on the left is the all sizes, which is that aggregated model. And then the other two are the two different components of that size structured model. In the background, you can see the predicted distribution. And then the bubbles are representing that uh, varying coefficient term that's on the end right there. So red indicates an increase in abundance with an increase in mean sea surface height. We're using this mean sea surface height to represent upwelling intensity, so greater upwelling intensity. The yellow is the opposite. Um, there's a decrease in an abundance with greater upwelling. And you can see that that pattern is not necessarily the same for each of these models. We don't see an entirely similar pattern. And so there may be something that we're missing when we take out size from these models. Some of that may have to do with relationships that different life stages have with the environment. So I want to point out some of these here. The top row is the size aggregated model, and then the bottom two are the two components of that size structured model. So for salinity, for example, we see a similar relationship with abundance um, for the top two, which is the small sizes and the size aggregated model. And then for the large sizes, we see a very different relationship with salinity. For sea surface height, we see a completely different relationship between abundance and sea surface height for each of the models. So we kind of see opposite relationships for the small and large sizes and sort of a combo for the size aggregated model. So this may explain why we're seeing differences when we um, predict those maps. And then for northern anchovy, some of you might be wondering, this is the one where it appears that it actually is beneficial. Um, we do see a difference again. So you see that the predicted distribution is different, and you see that the pattern in that varying coefficient term effect is also different. So for example, for small sizes, we see a decrease in abundance with increased upwelling intensity for the southern region, and then the opposite is true for large sizes. And this is just off the coast of California because of the limitations of the northern anchovy data. And again, we think that this might have something to do with relationships with the environment that are different depending on the life stage. So for temperature, we see a similar relationship in those top two, but there actually wasn't a significant relationship with temperature at all for the large sizes. With salinity, we didn't see a significant relationship in the size aggregated model, but when we broke it apart, you could see that there were two different relationships with abundance and salinity depending on the size. And then to sort of change gears here, um, one of the things that we are going to face when we do the forecasting is the challenge of uh, predicting uh, in anomalous conditions. And so in the, uh, in the California current system, we experienced a marine heat wave during 2014 to 2016, and it can be difficult to predict under anomalous conditions. We don't necessarily have a long enough time series to really do a great job of showing that here, but you can see that under certain years, there's a higher root mean square error, meaning it's harder to predict. It's not doing a great job of predicting for those years, in this case, in 2013. And then to bring it all back together, um, the first objective was, again, to determine if variability in life history impacts how uh, we can best model the distributions of different fish species. So 
All of those fish that were used in this research have differences in spawn timing, time in the water column, growth rate. Some have very episodic uh, spawning, others spawn throughout the year. So those are differences that may affect how we can best model them and also how things are picked up by the survey. Um, we also ha may have dependencies on size data. Not all fish have, not all of the species we used have super consistent um, length data throughout the entire time series. Um, and then the second one was to evaluate the benefit of using species distri distribution models that incorporate size. We saw with the root mean square error change, that reduction to the size structured model, that this is likely the case for northern anchovy um, on the surface. But for the other species, when we pull them apart, we can see that there are different relationships with that varying coefficient term, with the other variables in the model. And so it may be beneficial to continue evaluating whether we should include size for species where it wasn't necessarily clear uh, at first glance. And then the third objective was to investigate how fish distributions change in response to climate change. So obviously have not done this yet, but you can see from those plots that I showed you, the relationships between abundance and um, the various environmental terms, that those are different depending on the size or just depending on the model that you chose. So we expect that the forecast will be different depending on what you choose to do, whether you choose to incorporate size or not. Um, and so that's probably uh, going to affect those forecasts. And so stay tuned for those results. And uh, that's all I have. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, Rebecca. We have time for a couple of questions. That's a very nice talk, thank you. Um, I'm <clears throat> just wondering if you could just talk about the survey a little bit, and you talked a little bit about um, the, the presence of both, maybe seeing both sizes and within a year of the same species. Is that driven <clears throat> by the way the survey is conducted, that it's a long survey and that it's not conducted at a fixed time in every year, and that there could be, or are there examples of species where you see the full size range within a year that you could maybe disentangle this, this seasonal effect? Um, yeah, so the survey is pr at this point now relatively consistent when it occurs. Um, we do have two different ones operating and they're not necessarily always operating at the same time. From my understanding, I think this year they are. But um, so we see some of the faster growing species, you can see more of the life history and some of the slower growing species a little bit harder. Um, for species like Pacific sand dab, for example, they spend a very long time in the water column and so you will see like really tiny sand dab and then you'll also get these really big ones and so you can get a really good range for Pacific sand dab, for example. Um, so that's one of the species. Um, and rockfish you can also get, it seems like a decent, decent range. Um, anchovy also develops really quickly, so that can be um, another example. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. I just was wondering if, if maybe drilling into those species to sort of, again, to sort of um, just disentangle possible measurement error or some seasonal effects that mm -hmm. might be just what, what environmental variables might be available mm -hmm. to those. But anyway, it's yeah. really nice talk. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> One of you can ask me after. It's <laughs> um, uh, ask a quick question. Uh, in your size structured models, did you have any explicit dependence between life stages? So are you, are you predicting are you using one size to predict another or vice versa? No, we're not. It would be an interesting thing to do. So they're two separate models, I guess, if that's what you're asking. So it's completely separate. And then we add those predictions together at the end. The, the thinking there being that we're getting a proportion of size from the abundance. So proportion of the small versus the large. And so then adding those together. But I'm interested in exploring some options to connect those things. OK, thank you. You'll have to continue. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Moria Kiyasuhara. Hi, good afternoon. 
Now I'm a bit talking about a different topic. It's a deep time biodiversity in tropical biodiversity hotspot. It's basically about this review paper just published last year in Oceanography and Marine Biology annual reviews with a bunch of wonderful collaborators. So I'm talking about tropical biodiversity hotspot throughout the Cenozoic, that means for the past 63, 66 million years. And this is biodiversity heat map. On the top, it's the uh, entire animal groups. And the middle is some example of taxonomic group with a good fossil record, uh, in this case, bivalves. They show quite consistent pattern. And for the first of all, we see latitudinal diversity gradient, of course. We have much higher biodiversity in the tropics or lower latitude compared to bluish low biodiversity in Arctic Ocean and Antarctica. But even within the tropical latitude, biodiversity is not homogeneous, but quite heterogeneous with different biodiversity in different places. And now we have IAA in the Australian archipelago biodiversity hotspot or coral triangle here in southeastern Asia, Indonesia, and Philippines in the center. And here I use the World Biodiversity Hotspot as a place with extraordinary high biodiversity compared to other places. So it was now in coral triangle, but during the Cenozoic, it was not always so. So it's the topic today I'm talking about. So we focused on the group with good fossil record. For example, like corals, foraminiferans, ostracos, bryozoans. So this is the present day data for the taxonomic group with good fossil record. They show consistent pattern with our understanding. So coral triangle biodiversity, hotspot diversity shown by red is always higher than Caribbean sea biodiversity, for example, shown by orange in any kind of taxonomic groups with good fossil record. So we use this kind of guide to track down biodiversity in deep past. And in the deep time, it was a bunch of differences, like uh, geography and uh, continental arrangement was not the same as present. For example, during the Eocene time in 40 million years ago, uh, and Australia is much closer to Antarctica, and we have Tetis Ocean here, it's present day Mediterranean Sea, but uh, it was connected not only to Atlantic Ocean, but also to Indo-Pacific Ocean at the same time, composing huge tropical shallow marine habitat at that time. And we had a bunch of tectonic and climatic events, basically uh, continent continent collision and opening and closure of seaways and uh, climatic change. And associated with that, we had a different biodiversity hotspot. It was in Tetis before, and then Arabian Peninsula, Caribbean, and uh, IAA or Coral Triangles. We have nice historical change of that. It's a topic I'm talking about today. And recently, we have increasingly better data not only paleontological data, we have at least some good one in LBF, it means large benthic foraminiferans. It's a tropical associate foraminiferan group with really good fossil record. And uh, also we have geophysical modeling now, so we can quantify shallow marine habitat size and complexity as, for example, shelf area and the coastline length. And now we can use paleoclimatic modeling to reconstruct past sea surface temperature, SST, from the deep past to the pre-industrial or present. Then we have one good hypothesis or model, so-called hopping hotspot. And uh, this is a paper already more than 10 years ago, but uh, it's a good review and uh, argued biodiversity hotspot at Hotit hopped from Tetis, Tetis Ocean, the present-day Mediterranean Sea, during the Eocene time, like 40, 45 million years ago, 
and it moved to Arabian Peninsula and eventually to IAA or Coral Triangle from the Miocene to the present. It's basically tracking the place of amazing shallow marine habitat complexity of the continent continent collision area. At that time, it was a uh, Tethys Sea during Eocene. African continent is pushing up to European continent. And they have a lot of, lot of islands, complex coastline, and the great habitat to facilitate tropical marine biodiversity at that time. And the such place was changed to Arabian Peninsula and then moved to Coral Triangle. Now Australia is pushing up and uh, having nice habitat between Australia and the uh, Euro-Asian continent. But uh, this big picture say global, but it's not truly really global. We didn't include South and North America. So in this review paper, I tried to have truly global view of hopping hotspot in uh, the paleontological data. So this is some data with time series. The top is the past, 66 million years ago, and the bottom is the present, at zero. And uh, some paleontological data are not so nicely continuous, or they cover only partial period. So we may, for here, focusing on large basic foraminiferan data shown here in comparison with coastal line length and shelf area. So red curve means declining biodiversity in Tetian Sea through time. And in contrast, uh, by showing red, uh, IAA or coral triangle biodiversity going up, it's well consistent with changing in habitat size and complexity. Shelf area in Tetian Sea is going down and coastal line length is going down, but it's increasing by red line, so shelf area is increasing in coral triangle, and coastal line length is also higher than Tetian Sea region right now. So it's consistent. We can see biodiversity related to habitat size and habitat complexity. So, Key drivers or key environmental parameter seems obviously shallow marine habitat in complexity and size. But I'm thinking temperature could also be a factor possibly affecting the position of biodiversity hotspot. During the Eocene time, 40 million years ago, sea surface temperature was much higher than present. So you can see super reddish color tropical ocean here. Temperature could be 34, 5, 6 degrees Celsius. It's probably too hot for most of marine animals. It may be one reason we have a biodiversity hotspot in Tetris Ocean here at that time, because it's not in the equator, but a little bit higher latitude. So temperature is not super high. So in addition to complicated habitat and coastline, not too high temperature may be a reason of the Tetian biodiversity hotspot, I'm thinking. Then, going back to the same figure, we have better data than before, but it's not perfect. We need more data. We have relatively good data in large bench foraminiferans, but not as a taxonomic group much. Even coral fossil record at global scale is not as good as basic coraminiferans one, we don't see too much clear trend. And uh, we are having increasingly better modeling results, both geophysical modeling and paleoclimatological modeling. So in the future, we need to do more quantitative comparison and statistical modeling to better understand biodiversity and the driving factors uh, quantitatively. And I don't have too much time, so I may just summarize the global pattern in hopping hotspots, including Caribbean Sea and Tetris Arabian and uh, Coral Triangle. So this is time, like this is older time in the Eocene. This is a present. So biodiversity hotspot was in Western Tetris at that time in the Mediterranean region. And then it hopped to Arabian Peninsula to Coral Triangle to the west, as already known. 
but also in considering global paleontological data, it's probably hoped to east to the Caribbean Sea as well. Actually, Caribbean Sea region have one wonderful biodiversity from Eocene or early Miocene until the extinction event in the prior Pleistocene. It was the time uh, South America and North America connected, so that means Central American Seaway was closed. At that time, we had a really good bunch of extinction and the Caribbean diversity declined. So present day, we see super high biodiversity in the coral triangle, but not in the Caribbean Sea. So we need deep time knowledge to understand present and future biodiversity better clearly. And one more slide is more recent stuff, Anthropocene, human-induced tropical ecosystem degradation is now obvious. So tropical biodiversity is declining regardless of a reason more related to our own species, human being. It's just one example in Hong Kong because I'm based in Hong Kong. So this is historical and present day distribution of branching coral, Acropora. So reddit dot mean present day living distribution right now. And it's much narrower than the white dots here, more widely distributed. It's a historical record of dead acroporal shell. So before the Anthropocene or industrialization, acroporal coral had a much wider distribution than present day. So human impact on tropical biodiversity is kind of huge. So this is the summary here. So Tropical ecosystem and biodiversity is quite sensitive to future climatic change and other environmental changes. But uh, our future projection is not so sure yet. Uh, but we have good tropical fossil record to understand baseline better. It can be useful to think about future. But unfortunately, until at least recently, this rich resource of tropical fossil record remained understudied. So my message is we need more deep time perspective, but not only deep time perspective itself. More importantly, we need to compare fossil record to contemporary observation of oceanography and also marine diversity. Then we can have much better big picture for the present day and for the coming future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Yash, Moriaki. Do we have any question in the, in the room for Moriaki? Hi, Moriaki. Thank you a lot for the, for the talk. I was wondering whether you um, had the curiosity to, 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 to calculate the turnover of biodiversity according to your records. So I assume that you were uh, like uh, working mostly with N, so the number of species. And I was wondering how is the, because I guess that with the turnover you may uh, plot the speed of the of the change according to your uh, to the different uh, places or spots of biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So it's a good point. This is a compilation of available data. So sometimes we have good data, but it's more time slices. And uh, now I'm trying to have better time series in particular region, like Coral Triangle and Caribbean Sea, then I think we can say much more, as you say, turnover and the relative importance of extinction and origination. I think both of them are important. And we can study origination by molecular phylogeny, but not much extinction by molecular phylogeny. So it's important to compare both paleontological record and biological data putting together. Thank you very much, Muragi. We you. need to move forward. Thank you very much. Sure. Our next speaker is Gabriela Jostrom. Okay, um, thank you very much. So I'm Gabriela Jostrom. I'm a postdoc at the University of Bergen in the Theoretical Ecology Group. So the title of my talk is Bergman Patterns in a Warming Ocean, Their Mechanistic Basis and Implications for Projecting Responses to Climate Change. 
Um, so before I start, I want to acknowledge my collaborators on this project. Uh, firstly, Tom Longben, who is responsible for all the nice figures in this talk. Uh, if you see something that's uh, not so, so, yeah, I don't know, detailed, it's probably of mine. And then also uh, Professor Christian Jorgensen. Okay, so some background. I assume most of you are familiar with the term Bergman pattern which is the tendency of organisms to be larger at higher latitudes and colder temperatures, and smaller at lower latitudes and warmer temperatures. And Bergman patterns are one of the most well-studied biogeographic patterns. Uh, its study dates back over 150 years, when Carl Bergman introduced what's known as the Bergman rule. So the Bergman rule aims to explain interspecific body size clines in terrestrial endotherms, but the pattern is seen also within species, which is originally, originally James' rule, uh, and it's also seen in many ectotherms, where it's commonly referred to as the temperature size rule. Despite over a century of research, there is still no consensus on the cause uh, of these patterns, and there's still a hot and ongoing debate on the topic. Uh, that's not so strange if you consider the wide variety of organisms that these patterns uh, are observed. And in addition to that, there are many environmental factors other than temperature that also change across latitudes. Uh, in recent years, there's been a revived interest in Bergman patterns as reductions in body size have been linked uh, um, have been associated with climate change, both in endo and ectotherms, across aquatic and terrestrial systems. And there's been a growing interest in predicting how, or projecting how this may affect populations, communities, and species in the future. But here's a catch. If we do not understand the mechanism or mechanisms behind past or present patterns, uh, we will not, not be able to make any reliable projections about the future. Um, and I guess that's why we're here today, to kind of improve our ability to do so. So, uh, in this study that I'm going to present, or with this study, we wanted to better understand how interactions between different environmental factors that vary across latitudes, but also across seasons, how such interactions may affect expected body size patterns across a latitudinal gradient. We wanted to investigate the effect of warming on expected body size patterns and also identify the driver uh, and underlying mechanisms of uh, emergent patterns. Uh, so to do so, we developed a model that incorporates explicit mechanisms for vision-based feeding and temperature-dependent physiology. Uh, and we did so to, to investigate how external and internal constraints affect the energy budget associated with different body sizes and thereby the expected optimal body size. And when I say uh, external and internal constraints, I mean constraints that are external and internal to the organism. Uh, so, in, in our model, the drivers are the external constraints, and we included ambient light, a zooplankton distribution in terms of both abundance and body size, uh, and also ambient temperature. And here are the constraints that are internal to the organism or due to properties of the organism, but that are also influenced by the external environment. And I, I can see here already that I've made a mistake here. Of course, this this green box should include this red arrow here for metabolic rate. Uh, we parameterized the model for Atlantic herring. We ran it across a latitudinal gradient from 55 to 75 degrees in the North Atlantic. Uh, across this range, there is increasing seasonality and light availability and in prey abundance, uh, but decreasing seasonality in temperature. So we ran the model for the annual cycle uh, with these uh, environmental fields um, for a current temperature regime and with the two degree uh, warming across the whole latitudinal range. So what did we find? When, when we ran the model with the current temperature regime, a Bergman pattern in optimal body size emerged, and that's the, the 
well, uh, black line here that you see. And warmer temperatures simply shifted this pattern towards smaller sizes across the whole latitudinal range. So more interestingly here, what's the driver and underlying mechanisms of these emergent patterns? Well, the cause of this pattern is the interaction between light's availability and temperature, both across seasons and latitudes, that has different consequences for energy budgeting uh, in different body sizes, and thereby affects uh, the optimal body size. As I'm going to show you a figure here to illustrate in a bit more detail uh, what's going on, and then I'll move on to the warming scenario, because that's what we're most interested in here in this session. So this figure shows the energy budget, budget for different body sizes. And you have annual surplus energy on the y-axis and body size on the x-axis. And let's say that this is a snapshot for a particular latitude, and you have a figure like this for each latitude across the latitudinal range, just with different uh, magnitudes or different values. So this thick black line here represents or shows the assimilated energy or the energy uptake for different body sizes. And you can see that, let me see, you can see that for small body sizes, um, let me go back, um, the energy uptake is actually limited by the rate of digestion, whereas for large body sizes, it's limited by the rates at which prey are encountered or can be handled. And the optimal size, as we defined it, um, occurs at the switch point between these two limitations where surplus energy is maximized. So at this size, an individual has the highest capacity of converting energy from the environment into reproduction or other fitness-related tasks. So in nature, you would expect to see adults to grow to this size in the absence of other uh, selection pressures on body size due to intra- and interspecific interactions. So with warmer temperatures, uh, there's a higher metabolic rate or a higher rate of energy loss across all body sizes. But there's also a higher rate of digestion or a higher rate of energy uptake. And I'm just going to illustrate that with this exaggerated red line here. So this actually benefits small body sizes by alleviating the bottleneck for energy processing while uh, larger body sizes, they suffer from this higher metabolic cost in a situation where feeding opportunities are already maximally exploited. And the feeding opportunities are set by the light environment uh, and also by the prey, the prey environment. So this leads to a smaller optimal size across the latitudinal range. Um, Uh, I just want to, uh, it's important to note here that it's not only the effect of temperature on digestion and metabolic rate that determines the optimal size, but it's also influenced by the prey environment. So, so for, say for example that there's more or larger prey, that will raise, um, or that will lead to a higher prey encounter rate, that will raise this, uh, or it will actually lower the limitation, but it will raise this line here and thereby lead to a larger optimal size than the one we predicted uh, at first. Uh, whereas in contrary, if you have smaller or fewer prey, that will uh, lower the line and thereby lead to a, a smaller optimal size. So just to illustrate the importance of this effect, um, you could actually have an increase in prey encounter rate that fully compensates for the effect of temperature on digestion and metabolic rates, thereby leading to no, no change in, in optimal body size. So here, once again, uh, it's not only temperature that affects the optimal size, but temperature modulates effects of, uh, of other environmental factors, such as light availability and the prey environment, by regulating intrinsic constraints on energy uptake and loss. Okay, what are the implications of our findings for projecting responses of planktivorous fishes to climate change? Well, I want to focus on two things here because um, the theme of the session and that's the size structure or implications for and due to the size structure of populations and demography and collective behavior. So on a shorter, uh, shorter time scale, uh, the direct implications of our findings is that small or young and uh, old or large individuals may respond differently to warmer temperatures and also groups of small, young, or 
all enlarged individuals may respond differently. So how could this look like in nature? Uh, well, for example, in Norwegian spring spawning herring, uh, shifts in overwinter location have been associated with a high proportion of young to old individuals. And also sometimes you've seen large groups of young individuals establishing their own overwintering grounds. So based on our findings, this could mean that a population dominated by smaller individuals or younger individuals may not shift poleward, whereas a population dominated by larger individuals may do so. Um, also, in fishes, behavioral patterns are often transferred from experienced to naive individuals through social learning. So if you get a separation between uh, young and older individuals, you could cause, cause things such a, as a migration cycle, for example, to be lost from collective uh, knowledge. So that's on a shorter term, but on a longer time scale, um, like you saw before, our model predicts that we will see a Bergman pattern in, in body size in planktivorous fishes. That may not be so surprising. Uh, and also our findings that warmer temperatures are um, likely to lead to a smaller optimum size is also not so surprising. But um, we identify a new mechanism through which this could arise. Uh, and our study also highlights the importance of accounting for interactions between different environmental factors that vary across latitudes in seasonal systems uh, when predicting shifts in or projecting, sorry, uh, shifts in both body size and distribution um, uh, to environmental change. So that's for uh, planktivorous fish in particular uh, and for visually foraging ectotherms uh, at seasonal latitudes in general. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avila. Do you have some Thanks. questions? Yes, we do. Yeah, I just was wondering if you <clears throat> just were considering two important processes. One is the length of the, the growing season, loss of sea ice. Is There's just a longer growing season in, in the Arctic, and that's expanding. Mm. And I wasn't sure if, if duration and, and just the time to grow within a year was factored in or if that was not, that, that, that will shift. And then also with just the value of the prey, the prey quality is, mm. is very different in these Arctic systems and energetically much more rich, or at least it has been, and that's of course forecasted to also shift. But those are two important processes in the, in the Arctic. I wonder if, if you, uh, how you would consider them in this um, sort of this more macro, um, ecological context, I guess. Yeah, so this may seem like a relatively complex model. It's actually not, so um, it doesn't consider growth, but um, it considers the prey environment and the prey that the adults eat um, today that we see in the gut contents um, and predicts the optimal size that if you eat, if you have those type of prey in the environment, uh, what size will you grow to? So it doesn't consider that whole growth first, but that's why I'm saying that if you get changes in the, in the prey environment, which you could also model, uh, both with energy content and with the size, then you have different, yeah. I mean, of course, the prediction of the actual optimal size or the actual size is never going to be right, but you can still see how that shifts with different. So, I mean, it might shift differently with the energy content of the prey than the size. The size is super important for visual feeders. It has a way stronger effect than the abundance, for example. So, um, and size then correlates to, to the energy content because a bigger, yeah, a bigger prey has more energy. So, um, yeah, um, you can play around with those things and see what different scenarios uh, would lead to. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we have time for a quick question. Yeah, excellent talk. Thank I really enjoyed. Much. And uh, temperature and also metabolism could be also related to oxygen and yeah. also oxygen consumption. So yeah. I'm curious about your thought about oxygen in your model system. So, <laughs> yes. Um, so I model pelagic fish uh, at higher latitudes, and I would say that they don't, uh, they will not have any problem with oxygen in in a, in a shorter or in a reasonable future, 
But uh, of course, it will be different for demersal species. Um, a lot of the work on oxygen is on demersal species, and of course, on, on um, pelagic fishes at, at lower latitudes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gabriela. Yeah. Next speaker is Janet Neal. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> well, um, I'd first like to start off my talk by thanking my co-authors, uh, students Brandon Belts and Sarah Weisberg. Uh, PIs Leslie Thorne and Michael Frisk at Stony Brook University, and especially Sean Lucy at the NOAA Northeast Fisheries Science Center in Woods Hole, who's been helping us um, do some simulations between predator and prey in the RPATH uh, food web modeling. So we all know that climate change is causing the redistribution of biodiversity on Earth. Um, we've documented in both terrestrial and marine ecosystems the shifts that we've already observed in many individual species. And we know that those individual shifts have had uh, effects on ecosystem health, human well-being, and even feedback into the climate itself. Um, and we can go even further and make projections in time using global climate models about where we expect these individual species to be, um, or at least where their habitat should be. But what remains elusive is how will communities change um, in the future as a whole? Will they shift in concert, or will, they be, will those changes be a little bit more chaotic? But we do know that just by looking at the rates at which species are moving, that the species are moving at different rates, whether that be because uh, warming is occurring at different rates across different ecosystems, but even within one ecosystem, we know that the rates that species are changing is different. So that means that there likely will be some changes in predator-prey interactions, and that could ultimately disrupt food webs and the resiliency and stability of, of food webs. So that's what we wanted to explore. Um, I think one unanswered question is how will, uh, will predators simply follow their prey? And in, in, we're starting to look at that um, globally, but in the Northeast, um, here are two examples that, that show it depends, of course. Um, if you look at the North Atlantic right whale, this is um, a critically endangered uh, baleen whale species in the Northeast US. And we do see that it has shifted um, in response to its prey. So it ha does seem to have shift poleward following uh, where its um, Calanus finmarchicus uh, prey is, is more abundant. So it does seem to be following that, that copepod prey that it specializes on. In contrast, my colleague Leslie Thorne and I looked at longfin pilot whales, which as you can see here is a, um, a toothed whale species, again highly mobile like the, um, the North Atlantic right whale. But what we found actually was that this uh, generalist species actually shifted at a faster rate than either its fish or squid prey. So if you want to hear more about shifts in marine mammal distribution, see Leslie's talk tomorrow at 2.45. But what this shows is that, you know, there may be mismatches between, and pretty significant um, mismatches between predator and prey. Um, another example from Bartley et al. Um, from a freshwater system, showing that just surface warming can subtly change the vertical distribution of some fish species. So this is a lake trout um, predator within this, this lake. And as the, that predator shifted to deeper depths, we, you see changes in diet, so changes in the trophic interactions within this ecosystem where the predator relied more on offshore resources than nearshore resources. And if you want to hear more about how fish may be um, responding to changes in vertical climate velocity, and, and go see Laura Grunberg's talk tomorrow at 4.15. So we wanted to explore how these um, potential mismatches in predator-prey distribution may impact the mid-Atlantic bite ecosystem. 
So we developed a mass balanced food web model of the Mid-Atlantic Bight. This is um, a portion of the Northeast US um, extending from North Carolina um, up to just the edge of George's Bank. So this is a temperate uh, continental shelf ecosystem. And we um, implemented this food web model in our path, which is an implementation of the EcoPath with Ecosim framework in R. Um, and we incorporated a forced migration function in our path. Um, we wanted to look at how changes in the migration patterns of predators may um, cause a mismatch with prey. So we, we deliberately changed how the predators were moving but kept the prey relatively um, the same. This is our Mid-Atlantic food web model, and we focused again on those top predators that um, have large migrations. Um, so I'm gonna show you the simulations for spiny dogfish. This is one of the most abundant uh, small shark species on the shelf. We also looked at um, another functional group that's um, a mix of different species of large sharks, again, highly migratory, as well as smooth dogfish, another abundant um, shark. And then we looked at what happens if we just push the system really hard and look at all of these um, shark species um, experiencing changes in migration. So this is a historical migration pattern of, of most of these sharks. Um, they have seasonal migrations where they typically um, overwinter in warmer waters, either at the southern edge of this mid-Atlantic bite ecoregion, which is this, this uh, red polygon here. Um, and then in the spring, they'll move northward into the mid-Atlantic bite region. Um, and they'll continue to move northward in the summer. And you know, a portion of their biomass actually moves um, north of this ecosystem, and then, of course, they'll move back down south in the fall. And so we did three different things to explore how um, a change in this migration pattern may affect the food web. We induced a rain shift, so now what I'm showing you is the historical migration pattern in white, and then we simply changed the northern and southern latitude to be um, a little bit further north. And so now in the, they're more abundant in the mid-Atlantic bite in the, the winter and spring, but a greater portion of their biomass moves all the way out of the mid-Atlantic bite in the summer, and then it will move back in. So this results in about an 80% decrease in the biomass um, in the, in the mid-Atlantic bite food web. Um, the second thing that we did was change, keep the range limits the same, but induced a phenological change. So we changed the timing at which um, these sharks may, may move or migrate. And instead of having that migration happen over three months, it happened over five months. Um, and that basic, so you can see there's no change actually in the northern and southern latitude. It's just a different timing of when they move. And this results in about... Um, about a 30% decrease in the biomass in the mid-Atlantic bite. So I'm going to jump right into the results and just show you the results for spiny dogfish. Um, let me orient you first to these figures on the y-axis is the change in relative biomass over the baseline migration. Um, and I'm just showing you the fish functional groups um, at this, for these figures. And what you can see is for when we just did the range shift um, in spiny dogfish, we saw about a 5% increase in some of these fish species. And that range shift had a bigger effect than the phenological shift. You compare this top panel to this um, middle panel, which is just the phenological shift by itself. Um, the phenological shift did seem to affect similar trophic groups just to a, a lesser extent. Um, and then if you look at this bottom panel, uh, this is when we did both the range shift and the phenological shift together. And um, again, you see a similar pattern to this top range shift. And so the combined effect of these two things were mostly additive. So we, we looked to see if they were additive, synergistic, or antagonistic, but they were mostly additive. Um, and then I'm going to show you the results from the, um, oh, I'm going to show you the other functional groups. So these are some of the um, 
pred more predatory species. And what you can see when we, you know, change just the spiny dogfish is that some of these um, other predators like odontocetes, skates, um, sharks, and, and smooth dogfish increased in abundance. And of course, these are species that spiny dogfish doesn't eat, but there seem to be some indirect effects um, on the other predators in the system when we reduce the uh, presence of spiny dogfish in the system. And again, you, you kind of see the same pattern where um, the rain shift is stronger than the phenological shift and the combined effect is, is additive. Um, and then we, we did this with all the shark species together to really um, see how this might change the system. Um, and again, what you see is, a, you know, maybe a similar pattern with the range shift, but notice that the uh, units on the y-axis have changed, so there's a much larger effect, as you might expect, from changing the migration pattern of all these uh, predators. Um, but what you also see is this large drop in uh, small pelagic species here, and actually the um, the the decrease in small pelagic caused by the phenological shift alone was um, almost 20%. So just even a small change in, in, the cha in, the, in the timing of when these predators migrate may cause a big decrease in some of the, these trophic groups. Um, and when you combine a range shift and a phenological shift, you get um, a 34% decrease in the biomass of these small pelagics. But what we found most interesting was that there were really strong indirect effects. So this top panel is a similar figure to what I've been showing you before, just in orange. Um, it's the percent change in biomass over the, over the baseline scenario. And um, so you can see some of these increases in the fish functional groups, but the bottom panel is what spiny dogfish actually eat. So they um, are mostly eating squid, some fish, and crabs. Um, but if you look sort of to the, you know, what happens up here is that's not where the big changes occur. The big changes occur in functional groups that spiny dogfish don't actually eat. So it could be this, um, these indirect effects of, you know, some of the other predators or other species increasing abundance that causes those increases. Um, and similarly, this is the, the, the scenario where we changed all the shark species. Again, um, you know, we had that big drop in small pelagic species, but this is what those, the large shark functional group eat. So they're eating mostly um, some of these cod, or cod, other fish, and, and squid, but they, you know, small pelagics is not a large portion of their diet. So in conclusion, um, we've implemented this force migration function in our path finally. So um, we encourage other people to uh, use this modeling framework. And um, the range shifts had a stronger effect than the phenological shift, but as we showed, the phenological shift can have a large impact on some functional groups. And lastly and most importantly, um, we saw that when you, when you have a mismatch in the predator and prey distribution or range shifts, um, there can be really um, strong indirect effects. The, the indirects were the, the strongest impact that we saw, and thus can have unexpected and unanticipated um, consequences that we have to adapt to. So I'd like to thank our funding source, the National Science Foundation, our collaborators at NOAA, Stony Brook and uh, University of North Carolina, and mostly uh, my, my lab here, and in particular this guy, Brandon Belts, this was uh, his master's work, and so he did most of the modeling that I talked about today. And I'll take your questions. Thank you, Janet. You have some questions for Janet? Hi, and th thank Hi. you for a nice talk. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering about the diets of these sharks. Um, may it's maybe just a technical and stupid question, but in, the, in the, some of the last slides, you were adding up like 0.3, 0.4% of the diets on your, 
on your exit. I don't oh. understand how it can add up to a full diet when you have this. Uh, you know species. what? That was. It's probably proportion instead of percent. I have to. I would have to look at the oh, news. Sorry. But yeah, yeah, yeah they definitely. They definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's my bad. Do we have more questions for for Jeanette? I have a small question. Have you uh, made some scenarios because you assume that the prey, is, the prey field is stationary, so uh, some of the preys are moving too. So uh, do you plan to uh, you make some scenarios with some of the key preys changing too because they can change at a different spatial rate? Right, right. Um, I don't have any plans to do it right away. I guess a student needs to volunteer to do that. Um, <laughs> But we, but we did purposely create that mismatch because we have seen some of those mismatches. But it would be now that we've got the forced migration sort of figured out, we could we could play those games too. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alexander. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for, for this second uh, part of the session. And we have the third one in half an hour, so we'll convene in uh, half past three. Thank you very much. All right. Oops, sorry. All right, we are going to get started with the last session of the day for this, uh, for this session, session S10. Our first speaker is uh, Tom Langben. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Tom. I'm a postdoc in the theoretical ecology group here at the University of Bergen. I'm glad to see that some of you have found the way back from the coffee break. Um, before I get into the topic, I would quickly like to acknowledge my co-authors. This is, of course, not just only my work, but their brains have been connected to this as much as mine. Um, I will be talking today a bit differently about the topic of rain shift. I will not be only focusing on temperature, but I want to introduce a different aspect. I want to talk about how the lightscape at high latitude might be able to constrain rate shifts of species shifting into these high latitudes. So it's very important um, that towards higher latitudes, the day-night cycle actually starts to diverge seasonally with longer and lighter days during the summer months opposed to the longer and darker nights during the winter. And this has potential consequences for climate-driven rain shifts and species that are shifting into these high-latitude environments, tracking their preferred thermal habitats. But when they are shifting into higher latitudes, they will encounter increasingly seasonal light environments. And we have heard already a lot today about life histories and different behaviors, and their light plays an important role. And it's important to, noting, uh, to note that seasonality other than temperature is unaffected by climate change. So an important question is, at high latitudes, will the light environment act as a barrier to these climate-driven rain shifts? And many people have talked about it, but um, it has not been formalized into models yet, and this is exactly what we have been trying to do. So most of the state-of-the-art correlative approaches to species distribution modeling, they focus on temperature, they focus on habitat, but they often neglect the light environment at high latitudes, and they also often don't incorporate um, other ecological factors such as species interactions and behaviors. So to move from correlation to causation, we really need to understand the mechanisms. And our models do exactly that, so we incorporate explicit mechanisms both for vision-based feeding and temperature-dependent physiology. And it's important to note that in our models, the, the behaviors and fitness consequences are emergent and they are not rule-based. So today I will present evidence for two mechanisms which we have identified through which seasonality and light can act as a barrier at high latitudes. One is related to the dark season, and one is related to the light season. And our study systems are marine pelagic systems, and we focus on two widely distributed um, planktivorous species here, um, with two very different lifestyles. So on the top right, we have Norwegian spring spawning herring. It's a species that forages mostly in the surface waters um, that are sunlit. And then on the lower left corner here, we have a glacier lanternfish as a representative for mesopelagic species that are cosmopolitan and often do diavertical migrations, but spend their day uh, time usually at depths between two 
100 to 1,000 meters. I'm going to start with herring, and I want to give a brief shout out to my colleague Gabriella Lundström. You have seen her earlier today. She has presented the herring model already in much more detail, but she has developed the model and is the, really the brain behind that. Um, so we have energy reserves here on the, on the left-hand side, on the y-axis, and herring starts to fatten in autumn. And they build up these energy reserves to survive the long and dark winters, where there are limited opportunities to feed, both because there's less production and there's less light for them to visually find their food. And this particular population is a spring spawning stock, so all the energy that is left after the long and dark winter, that is energy that is used to uh, reproduce and is invested into offspring. Um, when we see increasing temperatures, what's happening is that these energy stores will exhaust faster all across latitudes just because the uh, metabolic demand is increasing, which then leaves them with less energy for their spring spawning life history and less uh, energy for reproduction here. However, this loss cannot be compensated in situ or by shifting towards higher latitudes where it's colder, because shifting north also means um, that when you shift further north, you're shifting into a darker environment. The nights become longer, the winter period becomes much longer, and they will not be able to compensate for that. So in this case, winter darkness is a barrier um, for, for rind shifts. However, continued sea ice loss, and that was a question earlier already, during the summer months might enable some of these species with large migratory capacities to actually exploit the summer months and extend their range during the summer months into the Arctic Ocean. A very similar argument can be made for mesopelagic fish um, and the midnight sun period. So I have said this before, this is a cosmopolitan group, we find it in almost all the ocean, but one exception seems to be the Arctic Ocean. Um, vertical migration, style vertical migration, so ascending towards the surface during night and then migrating down to depths during daytime again is a common strategy in this species group. And at low latitudes where we have a clear day and night cycle, um, they prefer to stay in their twilight habitat, which is here indicated by this gray band, and they migrate up and down in the water column. And at least during a 24-hour cycle, um, their preferred habitat here overlaps once with the, with the uh, rich surface waters where we, in the summer period, have most of the production and also most of the zooplankton then. And their feeding at night is always safe because we have periods of twilight near the surface waters, which is very different to the higher latitude environment. So at high latitudes during the summer months, the midnight sun is shining and it's therefore never safe for them to, to migrate to surface waters. So they are constrained really down to great depths, um, which leaves them with two poor options, so either they starve at depths or they take the risk and migrate into surface waters. Um, but eventually they need to abandon that light comfort zone when starvation is imminent, and it's better to take the risk of being eaten than to, to starve for sure. Um, so the consequence of this is both because of increased risk of predation, but also because of limited foraging opportunities that one projection from the model is that uh, high latitude environments are uh, population sinks for this mesopelagic fish, and this coincides roughly around the Arctic Circle here in the, in the North Atlantic. And then in this case, it's not the midnight sun, but it's the, uh, uh, it's not the mid, uh, polar night, but it's the midnight sun that is the barrier for this species group. And again, this is not going to change even if it's warming. The reason for that is that once temperature is increasing, the metabolic demand increases, and it just makes that situation worse here. So they have to take these foraging bouts more often, so the risk increases overall. And the consequence of that is that we actually see that this uh, turning point here would shift towards lower latitudes. Again, because they can't compensate for this at higher latitudes. Um, the magnitude of this projected shift is small. We see this both in the mesopelagic and in the herring model. Um, so we don't know if this will actually, if we will see this in nature. This will depend on many different factors. It just shows um, that it is, above all, very a pervasive barrier there. 
In nature, it might depend on, for example, if a species is able to shift longitudinal into colder waters. A good example here, again, is the Norwegian Sea, where we have on the, on the eastern side warm water flowing north, but on the eastern side, closer to the Greenland side, we have cold water flowing south. So there, there is some uh, factors here that are not included in the model. But in both models, across all our sensitivity analysis, we only saw southward shifts. We have never seen this barrier shifting loss. So we have speculated for quite a while about this, if there are also other species groups that are uh, restricted from shifting their environments into, um, into these high latitudes. And we were thinking about uh, other groups that live in the twilight or exploit this twilight uh, habitat, for example, bats, owls, and nightshares. And I was very happy to see that there is now a recent preprint from colleagues in Trondheim that seem to conclude the same. So they actually reached, independent of our work, the conclusion that photoperiod is the main limiting factor for bat species distributions here at high latitudes, and they also point towards the linked effects between temperature and the light environment. And so just to, to reiterate, the tame call message here is that seasonality appears to be a persistent photic barrier at high latitudes, um, that will constrain climate-driven rain shifts. And I think there's also really the need that we expand um, our toolbox um, beyond temperature-driven physiology. We need to include other factors and interactions, and we should also uh, make sure that we not only use correlative approaches, but that we try to incorporate more mechanisms into our modeling. Thank you. All right, great, so thank you. We have time for questions. So it's really interesting. Um, so what about body size? Would larger organisms that can store fat or nutrients over the winter be at an advantage then? So should these species increase in size? Or do you have any size difference? In these conditions? So the herring model is the same as the herring model that we have seen earlier that predicted that Bergman pattern. So in this case, we have only focused on one specific size group. Um, but that could be the case that larger individuals, in fact, are the ones that survive longer. For the mesopelagic fish, we actually see, we see this kind of Bergman pattern in the Southern Ocean in, in mesopelagic fish, where larger individuals seem to survive at higher latitudes better than small ones, so we don't see juveniles there, and we seem, we seem to see them the same in the North Atlantic. So one explanation could be that juveniles just don't survive the winter period, as you suggest, because the larger ones actually have that advantage, yeah. Okay, great. More questions? Thanks, Tom. Um, I, I was wondering, so we often assume, at least at uh, lower latitudes that these mesopelagic forage fish are not foraging when they're down in the mesopelagic zone. And I was wondering, in this environment where you're assuming that they're not coming up to the surface any more than they have to, do you know if, if they, it's been found that they're eating uh, like non, you know, like deeper living species, or do, is it apparent that they're indeed making that risk um, to the top? I, I would definitely assume that they wherever we are, when they find food, they eat, as long as they have yeah. capacity in their stomach. So that in the model, as soon as they can evacuate the gut, they will go look for food. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would be a loss in terms of energy that you can allocate to other fitness-related things. Mm -hmm. I think it's just that the densities usually at depths are lower, and you are, again, you only can feed them during daytime when the light penetrates deepest. Mm -hmm. So again, there's a constraint, uh, I think, just in terms of how abundant food down there is. But it might be different in fjord environments, for example. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for a nice <laughs> presentation. I have a question. About what about overwintering uh, uh, if I, uh, zooplankton? Is that, which are obviously far from the surface, is that something you considered in the model? That they could feed For on uh, overwintering during the, the winter? The mesopelagic? Yes. Yes. Um, they could during daylight hours, and we know from, from studies, from observations that they do, but then the zooplankton usually goes 
below that. So then zooplankton should optimize their distributions to be deeper than what the eye intent or the, the eye sensitivity of a mesopelagic fish would be. Even if, even if it's not deep enough, could they be trapped so that the mesopelagics can eat them? Yeah, so if we have shallow bottom topographies, so on, on the coastal shelf, I think we, we would see that mesopelagic fish could trap zooplankton at the bottom and feed efficiently on them. But then again, also mesopelagic fish eventually get trapped at the bottom and get eaten on by larger piscivorous species. So I think that's probably the reason why we don't have mesopelagic fish on the continental shelves. Yeah. Okay, good. So we can transition. Thank you very much. It was a great talk. Uh, we transition to our next speaker, who is uh, Marcela Nascimento. Thank you. Thank you. It's working? Oh, yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, today I came here to talk uh, a little bit about uh, work we developed uh, with some collaborators at Behinga Husson, uh, Lilia Gilead, and Thorsten Pedersen in the, uh, here? It's, yeah. in the Bering Sea. And yeah, uh, it's a long name, but it's actually we were wondering to know uh, how well one spatial dynamic model can predict the spatial distribution of functional groups in the last two decades in the Barents Sea large marine ecosystem that we hear a lot today, uh, mainly from the, the beginning of the, 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 the conference. And if this model can predict the changes in observed spatial distribution for, of the functional groups from cold to warm years, once we are seeing that this this has been happened uh, uh, in the Arctic. So, uh, to answer these questions, we decided to work with the Ecospace, that it's a spatial resolved uh, mass balanced model, trophic model. Uh, and to start this model, we need one ecopath model, and we are working with a high resolution mass balanced model with 108 functional groups uh, that was published in 2000. 21 by Pedersen collaborators, and this is a simplification of this model with the main uh, trophic flows. Uh, here is the Barents Sea, and we, we see that in the last two decades there is an increase of the temperature, uh, even though it's a, it's a change, it's an it's a oscillation, this temperature, but we see that it's, a, it's an increase. So we choose, once we were wondering to see if they are uh, representing this shift, and uh, from cold to warm years, we choose two years to represent one cold and warm years, but the years that we could have good information from uh, the environmental uh, um, information and also from the species distribution, mostly from the ecosystem survey of IMR. And we choose 2004 and 2013. Uh, and we have that we included in our model the bottom temperature, surface temperature, ice coverage, and primary production, mainly from the um, regional model that have the, 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 um, the historical data. So this model also allows us to make the envelope of the environmental tolerances for the functional groups. And we included this envelope uh, for 74 functional groups of our 108 functional groups. And this envelope is calculated mainly from the QGAM model, uh, uh, from the ecosystem surface from the IMR room, and also from the literature. And then we took the 35 functional groups with the higher biomass and good um, information from distribution to compare. And here we have one of the this 35 functional groups. It's a large crew. Here we have the observed distribution for cold and wa uh, warm years. And here's the predicted distribution for the, the, the model. This cross represents the, the center of the cross is the center of gravity of the distribution. And the cross is the, the inertia that is the main spread of this, the, the functional groups, the distribution. And we overlapped the, these two distributions here to see how far our, our, our model from the, the observed. And we saw here 
for the large crew, uh, that in the cold year, they are distant. Uh, 70 kilometers, the modeled and observed, and uh, in the warm years, uh, 2,020 kilometers. And if you think that our model, uh, uh, the, the grid of our model is 64 kilometers, here it's nothing, it's almost the same cell grid. And here it's pretty close also. So, uh, and if you think all the, the, the distribution uh, for all groups that we can compare, uh, the cold year is different, 19 kilometers, and the warm year is 26. So our model represented well. So then we were to our next question, that was, if we could uh, see in our model this, the represented the, the shift in the distribution. So here we have the example of the Kaplan, uh, with age uh, uh, bigger than three. And we saw, the, based on the um, IMR uh, ecosystem service, that from cold to warm years, they shifted 192 kilometers, most northeastern, but mostly north. And our model showed almost the same direction, but a little bit uh, shorter, it's 55 kilometers. Uh, and it was uh, uh, seen for most of the species, for most of the functional groups. If you see here, this radar, it's a, I hope it's not so difficult, but we, we can go step by step. It's, uh, we can see that it's a, it's a wind rose, it's northeastern, and it's degree. And each line represents one functional group, the center of the, the radar is the cold year, and the extreme is the uh, warm year center of gravity of these uh, functional groups. And we can see that the most of functional groups shift north and northeastern here. And our model showed the same direction. Of course, there is some uh, uh, species that move differently, but in general, the, the biggest pattern is the same. And we saw the average shift in the, the, all these 35 functional groups are 68 kilometers for the observed and 41 for the modeled. Uh, if you compare all the, 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 the communit, the modeled communit, it shifted uh, 40 kilometers northeastern, the communit as a whole, uh, in a rate of 67 kilometers per degree. So it could represent well how the, is the this community and these functional groups shifting for the, uh, in the, the, the warm, with the warming. So summarizing, uh, the model can represent well the functional uh, group's distribution and also can predict well the, this, the direction of shift that, that is mainly northeastern uh, and the average position, the displacement direction and the distance predicted by the model, model are very similar to the server-based observations. Uh, we published this in a recent paper in the uh, ecological modeling. But we are also wondering uh, if we could represent in the future. So this is now our actual step. We are working now on this. Uh, so we are uh, 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 um, simulating the future climate changes effects on the spatial distribution in this model. And we are working with three scenarios. The best scenario, that is the low carbon emissions, that is this SSP 2.6, the Paris Agreement uh, 4.5, and in red, the high carbon emission, that is the SSP 8.5. And we are working here with the NEMO Nuricom model, that it's uh, down scaled for the, to represent better the north, uh, the, the, the polar areas. And we are working with monthly, scenario, monthly uh, information, monthly data of surface temperature, ice coverage, primary production, and bottom temperature uh, from 2015 to 2009 and And we had some interesting results. We saw, oh, I'm sorry, here, I, I, I forgot to, to, no, I think it's plain, yeah. Here's the, the figure with the, the distribution projected for cabling in the scenario 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5, the good scenarios and the worst scenario. And here is the distribution, and the center of the cross is the center of gravity. And here we plotted the center of gravity of the distribution from 2020, 
in blue to 2099 in red. And we saw that in the scenario with the mitigation, uh, with we have the, the control of the carbon, we saw that they shift, in this case, eastern, but each, uh, each species, its functional group, shifted differently. We saw that they shift uh, eastern uh, until about 2050, 2060, and then they start to return for the start point. Not actually, uh, I think no, no one uh, returned exactly for the same start point, but close. So we could see that in the case that we have, we take action now, uh, the, the, there is the, at least the distribution in the Barren Sea that it's a, it's a um, high Arctic, an Arctic ecosystem, it returned from close to the, the start point. In both, in a kind of boomerang effect. But in the worst scenario, when we, there is no action of the, the, um, to, to reduce the carbon, there is a, 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 a crescent uh, shift from the northeastern, and it can be observed in most of the species. Uh, some high Arctic, it's, it's a little bit different, and we also evaluated the inertia if they are increasing or decreasing according to the, the, uh, the time. Uh, but they are mostly shifting northeastern. Uh, and we saw also this for the, uh, the community as a whole. Here is the, the uh, 2.6 um, scenario. 4.5, and here is 8.5. For the whole community in Anavert, they go north and return, northeastern and return. Here, go northeastern and return a little bit. And then, when we consider all the, the worst scenario, they go just further northeastern with no returning point. For some functional groups, they just stop, and for other groups, they return. So, of course, we're still in, in working on these results. We didn't publish yet, but we have an indic indication that if we take action now and change the, the pattern of our consumption, uh, we can have some, some good positive results in the species distribution, at least here. So, thank you. It was this. Very good. We have time for questions. Thanks for a, a nice, clear talk. Hi, I'm over here. <laughs> uh, your, dis your kernels you're comparing between the different years. The one thing I noticed was that the kernels are very different in shape uh, between the observations and the model. And so the model tends to have a broader kernel, and I'm just wondering if you could comment on whether you're trying to match the centroid or whether you're also trying to match the distribution of the species in terms of the shape. We, we were comparing the center of gravity for the, this shift, and also the, the, the ellipses is the, the inertia, and we also are comparing here, I presented just the, the center of gravity, just the, the inertia to see, but we are also comparing the inertia, and we can see some results regarding the spread of the, the species. For example, the boreal, the, the mackerel that was talking and it was discussed in another um, session mm -hmm. here. It is the, the inertia is increasing. Uh, uh, why it is in, in, going inside the, the Barents Sea, and in the return, it didn't return completely. It's, it's still mm -hmm. bigger. So we are comparing both, but here I, I focus it just in the center. Centroid. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm curious about as many of us are familiar with this Atlantification and the increase of warm water going into the Barents Sea, um, I imagine that many of the species in the area will be tr shifting their distribution eastward as they are confined to the shelf waters north of Siberia, for example, right? Like around Nova Zemlya and, and eastwards. So do you think that there are some species within the area that would be able to, let's say, shift their distribution to more suitable environmental conditions 
off of the shelf and in the, that deep polar basin? For example, like, do you think that pelagic species would show signals of being able to access that habitat as opposed to being confined to the shelf waters? <clears throat> um, let me think. I'm trying to, to remember all the, the distributions because there is, it, this, it's different because once we Put, we can include the limitation for each species, and there is the, the trophic interaction that is accounted in this, the, this model. Uh, some species are actually going more north, and there is some species like that are more coastal, they are going more northeastern and more southeastern, looking for the, 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 the shallow and cold waters in the White Sea. Uh, so I think that, that there are some species that are going at the assessing north. Of course, we didn't take account uh, the specific uh, uh, um, depth. It's, of course, there is depth also, but we cannot uh, stratificate so much the depth for the, all the, the, the functional groups. But uh, there is some groups that are going northern, it's going more, I think, for example, the Greenland halibut, if I'm not wrong, go further north, uh, where now it's the, the ice and go more further north. All right, great. Thank you very much for the <laughs> great presentation. We transition now. <laughs> and the next speaker is uh, Jadzil Oled Cheik. Uh, hi. <clears throat> okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jozel Oletzer, and I'm a third-year PhD student at the University of Barcelona and the Institute of Marine Sciences, which is in Barcelona, too. <clears throat> and today I'm going to be talking about one of the chapters of my PhD, which is about the assessment of how will habitat suitability change for a key predator species of the Southern Ocean, which is the Antarctic fur seal, in different climate change scenarios. Uh, so, yeah, we'll be talking about climate change here today, and we have this figure that you already have seen many times, which shows the warming trend of our planet uh, along the last couple of centuries. And this is important, and it is interesting to look at what has happened and what is happening currently in the planet to be able to understand how it is responding to this human-induced warming. But another exercise that is interesting and important in order to design and implement policies around climate change is to project these changes into the future uh, by designing uh, different possible futures, uh, going from uh, futures from uh, very low forcing at the bottom of the figure to very high forcing at the top of the figure. However, this is only giving us information from the temporal side, and uh, in climate change it is also very important to look at things from the spatial side of things, because uh, the impacts are not homogeneous all around the globe. And for example, here we have the warming situation of the planet in 2022, uh, in uh, 2100, in a weak forcing scenario, in a mid forcing scenario, and in a very strong forcing uh, scenario. So we can see that the impacts are not homogeneous all uh, around the globe. So all of this is having already many societal impacts that go side by side with uh, many ecological implications. And one of the ways in which species are uh, coping with these climate change driven environmental variations is by shifting their distributions. And distribution uh, shifts can occur both as expansion or contractions. And uh, here we have uh, two examples. Both are expansions and both have in common that they are going uh, polewards uh, regarding their historical uh, range. Uh, this can also happen uh, in depth uh, in the ocean and in altitude in the terrestrial environment. Uh, keeping with the poleward uh, shift, here we have a map showing the invasion intensity in 2050, and we can see that there are two zones in the world that are going to be pretty impacted by that, which are the poles, uh, which poses a major challenge for current polar species as they are not going to find uh, their current conditions elsewhere in the future. Also, it is, wor it is worth noting that marine species can track better uh, climate change and terrestrial one at a pace of 72 kilometers per decade. Also, that exotherms are more sensitive to these uh, environmental changes than endotherms. And if that we look at these end exotherms as prey for larger organisms uh, such as uh, marine mammals or seabirds, uh, these predators can also be highly impacted by trophic amplification processes. So, after this bit of background on 
the uh, species distribution shifts. Here we have the species that we're going to be talking about today, which is the Antarctic fur seal, which is a key predator species in the Southern Ocean. Uh, it is a marine species, it is a polar species, and it feeds on exotherms. Uh, so it makes it a good sentinel to uh, look at these, uh, these changes. So uh, it, I said it feeds on exotherms, uh, it feeds on uh, krill mostly and also penguins in the location that we're going to be talking about today, which is the southernmost population of this uh, species. It's, this species distributes all along these two sectors of the Southern Ocean, but we're just going to talk about this population in the, southern, uh, in the Atl Atlantic sector of the Southern Ocean. Uh, okay, so from the biological point of view, there are some facts that are important uh, in order to better understand our results later on. Uh, first, this, this species is highly sexually dimorphic, which means that males are ha way bigger in size than females. Here we can see a male and a female, which has implications in their diving capabilities. So males can dive longer and uh, uh, deeper and for longer than females, which has implications in the prey they can reach and chase in different parts of their life cycle. Uh, also, uh, females are highly philopatric, which means that they chose, choose year after year the same foraging grounds, and they have this kind of uh, central place foraging during the breeding season that we're going to be looking at it uh, later on in the presentation. And finally, they are polygenous, which means that uh, a male looks after a big harm of females. Uh, so, yeah, after this bit of background on the species and the distribution shifts, here we have the two main research questions that we're going to be trying to uh, uh, answer today. First, where will the suitable habitat for Antarctic fur seals shift along the next century? And second, how will climate change influence the future availability of suitable habitat for Antarctic fur seal males and females? Uh, to try to answer these questions, we will rely mostly on two data sets. Uh, first, we have a tracking uh, data, data set. Uh, and second, we have all the environmental covariates that we're going to try, uh, that we're going to use to fit our model models. These are environmental variables extracted from the ECMIT portal, which is a portal that uh, delivers uh, standardized output from the last round of, uh, of uh, runs of model runs from CMIP6. And here we have the timeline of these environmental variables from the 1850s until 2100, with a hingas phase and a forecast phase with the three. Uh, forcing uh, scenarios here, and uh, here are the, all the variables that we have used to fit our models. We don't need to go through them, but just to give you an idea of how many variables are now available. And uh, here we have how our tracking data set overlapped with these environmental variables, uh, em environmental timeline. So we have uh, our data set on females in the summer. Uh, we have seen that this is a marine mammal species with a complex life cycle, so we need to model, uh, of course, males and females se separately, and also uh, different parts of their life cycle separately, because they behave totally differently. So, data set on females in summer, females in winter, and males in winter. But how does this data look like? Here we have the data set, uh, the tra tracking data set for females in summer. Uh, we can see that they are performing this kind of uh, central place uh, foraging behavior uh, during the breeding season. These are the South Shetland Islands, this is the very tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, and these females are just going out at sea and going back to the colony to feed their pups. Let's now move to the data set of males in the winter. Males in the winter stay in maritime Antarctica, and they do so because they can. I said they are big, so they can dive uh, to very deep uh, um, uh, depths. Uh, and krill during winter in Antarctica goes way down regarding summer in, uh, in, in depth. So males can reach krill during winter, but females cannot, so they spread in the ocean looking for krill inhabiting uh, less deep uh, areas and uh, uh, also looking for other prey items. So, yeah, let's go a bit uh, through the methods. Uh, we see, I've seen that we have this biologging, tracking data, and this environmental data. So, imagine this is, is a track of Antarctic fur seal. Uh, we need to go through a series of uh, smoothing and filtering this data. Then we have the track uh, nicely uh, cleaned. Then we need to generate pseudo absences because one of the issues with tracking data is that we don't have absence data, so we generate pseudo absences. And then we need to cross this information with environmental covariates, extract the environmental uh, values, so associate the environmental values that we have uh, to each one of these uh, positions, and then go through the modeling uh, framework uh, in which we used boosted regression trees and predict uh, into the future. And this is a tagged female, just for you to know how it looks like. Uh, okay, so let's go a bit through the results. Uh, here I am showing the results for males in the winter, and I will just break this figure down for you. So we go step by step. Here we have three columns, right? 
The, uh, this is the column for the present, column for the uh, 2100 in the weakest forcing scenario, and 2100 in the strongest forcing scenario. Uh, in the present column, uh, we have uh, we are seeing habitat suitability, which goes from zero to one, and in uh, the uh, in the future columns, we can see habitat suitability change. So reds will mean loss in habitat suitability, blues will mean gain in habitat suitability. Then we have the rows. Uh, this is uh, the winter split in three parts. You know, Antarctica is a very seasonal place, so we need to take into account these intra-seasonal differences to be able to see a bit more uh, detailed the whole picture. So uh, early winter, let's go uh, here. Uh, in this panel here, we can see that for males, as we have seen before, uh, suitable habitat is around uh, Antarctic uh, Peninsula. And if we uh, move to the other scenarios, we can see that in the weakest forcing scenario, habitat suitability increases around the Antarctic Peninsula for this species, but in here we don't see an expansion. But if we move here, we can see that the species may find suitable environmental patches more uh, south in the, into the Bellinghausen Sea, and more interestingly, we can find new patches in where right now it is packed with ice. Also, uh, let's move just to the most important things here. We can see that all the patches in the strongest forcing scenario are displacing southwards um, into the Antarctic continent. Uh, so, yeah, new patches and southward displacement in the future. Uh, in for females in the winter, we have seen that they behave quite differently than for males, and the tail is quite different here. We can see that in the present, uh, habitat suitability for females spreads to all these zones, and uh, if we move to the strongest forcing scenario already, we can see that uh, the habitat uh, suitability is predicted to decrease a lot, and a vast... Uh, uh, area of suitable habitat is going to be probably lost in this Pacific sector of the Southern Ocean, and the uh, suitable habitat is going to be shrunk and concentrated nearby the uh, Antarctic continent, which may have problems, as I, I said before, with uh, finding prey with the krill and also some uh, possible uh, competition issues with males. Uh, finally, here we have uh, the data set for females in the summer. Uh, we can see uh, that uh, the uh, habitat suitability for the present uh, it is uh, around uh, the colony, and that it increases in the weakest forcing scenario, and it also increases a bit in the uh, strongest forcing scenario to a lesser extent. However, this is the trickiest part of the cycle to model, because this will not only uh, depend on how uh, things are at sea, but uh, they will, uh, it will also highly depend on how things are in land, as this species needs specific kind of beaches to, to breed. They need ice-free pebble uh, beaches, and uh, we don't have the environmental information projected at a fine scale we would need to uh, try to incorporate that in our, in our models. And this also raises the, uh, the question around philopatry, right? We don't know if this genetic philopatry that, that females are displaying, so uh, choosing the same breeding grounds year after year will preclude the uh, uh, formation of new colonies around uh, places that may be uh, of uh, higher environmental suitability or with higher prey uh, concentration in the future. Uh, so, yeah, this was everything I wanted to tell you today. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. We have time for questions. This is a 10 seconds rule, right? <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I was curious, what do we know about uh, the distribution of krill uh, across the seasons? And does it correlate with your findings? So we have not included directly uh, krill data into our models, so I don't really know about that, but uh, I just, uh, what I know is that krill is also shifting uh, southward right now, like the general trend. So, yeah, that, yeah. yeah, that's the only thing I can tell you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Thank you. Yeah, the question, so, because it are endotherms, um, they might be less affected by temperature directly. Uh, so do you think that the patterns you observe in your current spatial uh, state are more prey-driven than temperature-driven? And then I get a little bit to the creole question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, 
Yeah, yeah, of course, like uh, this species is not probably affected directly from temperature for sea, so uh, this is like the patches they are visiting now are patches where they are currently finding uh, prey. Uh, mostly like in winter, probably this is mostly prey driven. In summer, it, uh, we have to disentangle the effect of the position of the colony, right? Because like this, like they cannot do like crazy long uh, foraging trips. So this has an effect too. But yeah, of course, like for the, pres uh, for the present, uh, I, would say, I would say yes. So it would be interesting to like include uh, trail data actually in this kind of model. Right, thank you. We have time for another quick question, if there is one. Hello, this may be a silly question, but could marine mammal body condition be negatively influenced by warming trends based on how they're able to dump heat in the summer time, for example, and then perform within yeah that habitat area? And is also his body, because I have friend in the marine mammal world, and there's a lot on body condition nowadays. Was that also something that is uh, in your research or in related research? Yeah, I, I totally think that body condition would impact uh, the, like, how long, also, like, how long can they travel in winter without, like, finding prey and so on. But also, like, if there is, like, a, a mismatch with prey, their body condition will be worse and will, uh, yeah, this will be more challenging for them. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much. We need to transition. Uh, we do have to synchronize with the other session, so we have two or three minutes, which we can just use to take a breath and the rest. Or um, if you have questions for previous speakers, you can ask. Uh, or even comments. Otherwise, we resume in uh, three minutes. Okay, so we can resume with the last talk for today, and uh, is given by Mark Costello. Thank, thank you. you. Got really in the spotlights up here, so thank you for all uh, for staying. Um, and I'm turned on, as they say, so you can hear me. Good. Um, yeah. So these are my co-authors of the paper that we've been struggling to get published. So um, 
because uh, you'll see that it falls into two camps, people who work in energetics and people who do ecology. And when you, we end up with uh, referees in, in both camps not believing the other part of the paper. So I'd be interested to see what you think. So one of the things is our observations on macroecological or biogeographic patterns in the ocean. And um, I can't, we kind of see these all the time. And I, I thought we had a workshop to try and figure out, is there any overall theory or you know, temperature must be related? Is there some general theory of temperature? And then um, my co-author on this talk, Ross Corkery, turned up and he works on bioenergetics. And he said, yes, there is. And he has it. And he's published the papers in Astrobiology and other cool journals like that. Um, and if I first noticed this when Hania Saidi was doing her PhD in razor clams, and she found this, this is latitude here and number of species in total in that latitude, which is the same for most of the graphs here. And she found this decrease at the equator. And um, we thought this is very surprising and it must be due to sampling effort or something. So she went to the museums and checked it was correct. And the journal accepted her paper and they said, but you can't call this bimodal. We said, why not? He said, because we know that biodiversity increases its peaks at the equator. That's a fact. So um, we then got annoyed. So we went to the literature and checked the literature. And Chaya Chadhadri um, did her PhD following up on that. And when we looked at any database and pretty much all the literature, um, there was always a dip at the equator in recent decades. And the three graphs here, are the number of species per latitude, which of course is biased by sampling effort in the northern hemisphere. Um, if you take the total number of species, it sort of averages that out a bit. And if you use the estimated species or if you run GAM models, there's always a little dip at the equator. And Chaya went and then this using the OBIS database. The paper actually has three time periods, but I just show two here for simplicity. And you can see that there's a clear dip in the equator both before the 1980s and after the 1980s. And um, this dip is getting deeper over time. So this is exactly what's been predicted by the climate change species range shift models, and it's increasing in the northern hemisphere. And it's the same for benthic and pelagic species. And of course, this is data could be improved now with better data, um, but uh, it's a little bit messy, but it's still very compelling. Um, and then uh, Moriaki Yozuhara, who's somewhere here maybe. No, he's left, he spoke here earlier. Yep, he's at the back. He did a very nice paper using Foraminifera, which is a very cool data set because they have all these cores in the sediments and people count Foraminifera in deep sea sediment cores. It's amazing why people do this, but they do. And they've really done a very good job because uh, they have data going back then in the sediment cores in the last glacial maximum to the present. And if we look at the last glacial maximum, there was a slight dip, or, but not significant at the equator. But now there's a stronger dip and if you look forward, this dip will increase. So just looking for aminifera, but one might think, well, they're just for aminifera. Um, but if um, you look at the, when this changes, you see this curve, which is not symmetrical, and there's a change at around 20 degrees in both the last glacial maximum and the recent centuries when richness starts to decrease. So this got us thinking, and Shia ran the same data with all these different groups of species in Obis. And, you know, it's a bit messy how you, you classify these species. But we see this for pelagic fish and for benthic invertebrates. We see a decrease. This is a GAM model, and each point is a latitudinal number of species, which accounts for the sampling effort bias. Uh, for benthic fish, it seems to increase at a higher... Uh, the decrease happens later. And it's also worth noting that these curves are asymmetrical. So you get very slow changes at low temperatures, but when it gets too hot, it you, you get a more uh, faster drop in species richness. Um, and we repeated this for lots of other taxa in our paper. And some of them, most you start getting for polychaetes, arthropods, bivalves, we see around 20 degrees, gastropods, but not for reef-associated fishes or demersal fishes. So we could also look at a completely independent data set. This is in the Reef Life Survey, which are standardized scuba surveys of rocky and coral reefs. And uh, Rick Stewart-Smith has shown that you can kind of identify three climatic gills, polar, temperate, and tropical species, in fish and invertebrates. And this is pretty cool. You think, um, yes, yeah, so most fish occur in the tropics, so warm temperatures above 20 degrees is, should have more species. Why does the species, number of species start to decrease? But if you plot this another way, 
and you t separate those gills and you classify the species by their, their, their median temperature of their range, you, might, you see, of course, the overlap. When you add the species together, then you start getting this peak at around 26 degrees where you start getting decreasing richness. But for invertebrates, this uh, change is at a lower temperature, just as we saw with the OBUS data. So, <clears throat> to kind of summarize, we, we already see the equator is too hot for some species, and it's intriguing in Moriaki's talk about the paleoecological data, maybe even back in long distant time, when we had those warm, warmer Earths, that the tropics were already too hot then for species, and we got highest diversity in mid-latitudes, as we're already starting to have now. Um, okay, those points are already made. So, if we look at thermal energetics, we always see this classic curve here. And myself, because I'm not an energetics person, I always think of, you know, this is the thermal optimum where the processes are fastest and the species can grow fastest and so on. But it's actually not really the evolutionary or survival optimum. Because if you want to survive, you don't want to be living right at the edge of your, your temperature limits. Because the temperature just gets a little bit warmer and you're dead and you don't have any children left, so that's not good. Um, so you want to be living a little bit below your optimum in this kind of safety zone here. <clears throat> so the question is, where, where will this temperature be? And what Ross Corkery has done in his uh, several papers on this, looking across domains of life, protozoans, metazoans, um, and bacteria, he's called this, the, he looks for the temperature of maximum enzyme stability. So this is the, the area of maximum enzyme stability is here, and it's below the actual optimum or what used to be called the optimum. <clears throat> um, an interesting uh, paper by Dell and others reviewed a 1,000 species, and uh, they found that this, the temperature where most of these species overlapped was at 19 and 21 degrees centigrade. So that was kind of curious as well. Now, when um, all domains of life, and they plot the, ther the thermodynamic stability range, this ends up to be lowest at around 20 degrees across all domains of life. So this is where the cost of enzymes and energetic costs are lowest at 20 degrees. And there's even suggestions that this may be due to fundamental properties of the, the cell chemistry. Um, and so this means that species will tend towards being stenothermic at this temperature because that's a, a nice, efficient temperature to work at. And as they move away from this, the energetic cost of living at lower and higher temperatures may increase. Um, so we did a systematic review because some people didn't believe us picking all our nice examples and saying this is very nice. And when we do this systematic review, um, we've run 7,000 samples, and we can see that most species ranges will overlap around 20 degrees centigrade. <clears throat> And this occurs actually in there's terrestrial, freshwater, and marine species here. So what we think is that 20 degrees centigrade, we might call it a 20 degrees centigrade effect. It's the most stable and efficient temperature for protein synthesis. But this actual um, phenomenon is actually carried through to multiple levels of biology and ecology, right up to higher levels of biodiversity. So 20 degrees centigrade, you might say it's the Goldilocks zone for life. Um, not everybody knows the Goldilocks story, but you can ask somebody else about Goldilocks and the three bears and which porridge was the right temperature. <coughs> so, of course, many species evolved to live in much higher temperatures and much lower temperatures, but they're relatively few in number. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have uh, questions? They don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so I ask you to look in your own data sets for any of these temperature patterns because the relationships to temperature are obviously not linear. And uh, I think uh, Eric Ward, if he's still here. Eric, Eric's still here? No? He gave a talk about, uh, Curtis Deutsch gave a graph on some of their data, and they also show interesting effects around 20 degrees as well, which may be related to this. Yeah?
Hi, uh, super interesting talk. I was just wondering uh, about um, sort of how seasonality comes into this, and in, in more seasonally, seasonally variable environments, you should do further from your peak just to sort yeah. of be safer for these fluctuations. And how, how does that c come into this? We, we uh, used the annual average temperatures. So, and did you right? There, there's a there's a big. We can't really connect the mechanism by how this stability at a cellular level links to annual average temperatures because of seasonal effects and, and, and many species you know, live happily at 30 degrees for part of the year. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. We have to research that. <laughs> More questions? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so how would you make the translation from the enzyme uh, to, to species richness in the end? Uh, is there any, any idea how, uh, say, optimal enzyme dynamics leads to more species? Uh, I, th I think it's because if, if it's most efficient, pretty most species can live at 20 degrees, and then they adapt to live at colder and warmer temperatures to avoid competition with other species. So I think this is, uh, 20 degrees is kind of the area of overlap where all, most species can live. And, and then we think about, of course, all warm temperate and uh, species in Europe, even in Norway, will live at, will survive at 20 degrees in the summers and the fjords, but so will tropical species. Yeah. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but <laughs> sort of. Thanks. Uh, maybe I misunderstood, but was the example with the fish species at 26 degrees, was that kind of like an exception then? Or yeah, exactly. It's an exception we can't explain. Okay. But we, we think it might be because these are reef fish and they tend to live uh, and they're mobile. So maybe they can s avoid these warmer temperatures in the summer, like the, the seasonal effect you're mentioning. So when it's too warm, they swim to deeper waters to keep cool. Maybe, maybe there's some effect. And there's some suggestion in the literature that fish do move with depth uh, to avoid you know, both storms and, uh, and extreme heat wave events. But, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. Very stimulating and interesting talk. I was wondering, have you uh, considered looking into the fossil record to look at extinction rates of species? On a latitudinal basis, we've only thought about it, but it's worth definitely worth looking into. That's why Moriaki is here. I'm, he's uh, he's our paleoecologist. He should be doing this. <laughs> I think actually he has some suggestions in our paper. I think we have a paragraph where we do see some effects. Is that right, Moriaki? Do you want to comment? Can Thank you. So, yeah, Imaku is discussing about the time scale of tens of hundreds or thousands of years. And uh, in the ocean, it's usually much shorter time scale than macro scale evolution of like uh, origination of new species or a big bunch of extinction. We didn't have such much in the ocean in this time scale. So the thing must be explained by the range shift like moving north, moving south of already existing species instead of extinction or origination. Yeah. All right, thank you. I think we have reached the top of the hour, so it's time to take our break. I thank the speaker. Thank, thank you very you. much again. I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, remember to bring your badge when you go to the reception. <laughs>